you crazy da, 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 da. still rock and roll to me da 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 Hello everyone, how are we doing? As you can see, I have a rather big fluffy pal with me today who's basically going, Hello! I'm here, and I'm centre of attention. Which is his, always his way. So, you know, hey-ho, it enjoys. He does enjoy it. He does enjoy being the centre of attention. He does. He really, really, really does. And let's see, we've got live chat. Hello, Sp Frank Spurner, hello. Hello, Carmen Gasberg. This will be a live we observe by the latter day day, uh, the latter day biplane. Really? Um, come on, so what if the Tsar decides to send a bit more and all the armor cruiser rook in the six times two ten inch version? What happens to the, with the Invincibles and the SMS Luca? Well, the Invincibles probably say the same because let's be honest, they would have enough firepower. They have 12 inch guns and call them battle cruisers, call them frigates, call them whatever you like. They have enough guns and enough firepower. Thank you. Um, but Bluka, that's the interesting one because if you've got an all 10 inch gun armored cruiser rook coming along, then. Well, the Germans can't afford to be completely outpaced by the Russians, can they? Ah! Right, Spano, Queen Victoria has shown the future of World War One. What could she do to make sure it never happened? Or alter history in a way that makes it less body or shorter? Uh, probably invite Wilhelm to dinner and slap him around the head a couple of times. Maybe just poison his, his tea. Um, honestly... Knowing her, she can be pretty ruthless, so get rid of him. Also, Battle Frigate. Got it. Glad you got it. Hello, Peter Dawson. Hello, Rick Vasava. And all the Band 1 learners. <laughs> Hello, Matthias Slavic. Hello, John Shea. Rick Vasava. What if Britain never entered World War One? How would Germany look after the war, and would that eventually lead to war with Britain at a later date, and would Britain be able to win that war? Um... Basically, if Britain doesn't enter World War One, expect a rerun of the Franco-Prussian War. But expect it to be very interesting because if Britain doesn't enter World War One, what does the German Navy do? Uh, it probably loses its status even more to the army, so it would have a big issue because basically it would be pointless. Although they probably claim that their presence stopped the Br uh, stopped the British entering the war, so at a certain point you would end up with a war between Britain and Germany. At that point, the British naval lead will probably be mahusive, but Britain wouldn't have many allies. Hello, yes, I'm cleaning your eye out. Yes, you've got a lot of stuff gunk there. Sorry. Rick Russell, as horrible as this might be, what if there was no I'm Um The world would be far far more dangerous as let's be honest if there's no iron brew and no, uh, there's probably no whiskey if there's no whiskey and no iron brew then the scots have nothing else to do but take over the world <clears throat> hello right <sighs> can, sir, sir, can you please clarify weather gauge leeward windward well Okay, so if you have the weather gauge, that means you ha usually have the wind and the weather behind you, which means you can be slightly faster and you can dictate the, uh, the, the, the pace of battle. So normally, if you have the weather gauge, you are to the windward side of the enemy and the enemy are to your leeward. Um, Dirt Squad, hello. This transport, hello. DGB40, hello. Kilo 19, hello. And he just flow. Hello, everyone. Three cheers for the fucking research assistant. Yes, he's basically ensuring Papa doesn't go away on a whole, another trip anytime soon because, frankly, the biscuit supply gets a bit small when Papa's not here, doesn't it? Yes, it does. 
gets a bit small. Um, Frank's Manor, if the, in the public eye the battleship is defeated by aircraft at Pearl Harbor or 4C, when in the military eye did it happen? Mm, in the nicest way, the battleship was never really defeated by aircraft, it was rendered pointless by them. In that it was still a useful asset, that's why you get the reactivation of battleships during the Cold War and various other things. They are still useful. Uh, it's just, are they useful for, are they a something you can spend money on when you can spend money on something else? It, it, that's the thing. Battleships aren't really defeated by aircraft. They're defeated or aircraft carriers. They are supplanted by aircraft carriers, and you can, uh, treasuries won't provide you money to build both. So you have to build one or the other. So you build the one which is most useful. And aircraft carriers are more useful than that, and then battleships. This Ransful, I don't see Queen Victoria would kill her grandson. Queen Victoria had a vision for a Europe united peacefully in a liberal uh, liberal monarch, uh, monarchy, uh, monocracies, which she and uh, Albert had come up with. In the nicest way, Wilhelm was flying against that. And World War I would be seen to destroy that, in her opinion. So, uh, yes, if she saw that coming... Yeah, I would not want to be Wilhelm, as I said. Either killed or whacked around the head many times with a stick by Grandma. And a stinging assault which he could never get away with. Descott, when does she see the future? She could refuse the marriage offer that led to Wilhelm II being her grandson. Uh, potentially. But then he might come about still, whereas if he's her grandson, she can, she has the power to demand him to come to tea and give him a, a nice poison chalice. Thanks, madam. Is it true that Mussolini ordered his cruisers to not to attack the pedestal convoy? Why? Would Malta actually surrender if it not made it? Um, no, he didn't order his cruisers to not attack the pedestal convoy. They didn't manage to... Uh, g Let's put it this way. Uh... Malta may have surrendered if a pedestal hadn't made it. It would have been very tight, but they might not have. But Mussolini ordering his cruisers to not attack? No, it's just they didn't have the fuel and the viability to get out there in sufficient numbers. He ordered, his orders were to not attack unless you could win. And it's getting the numbers and the fuel and the ships together to win. Hello. Right then, let's see. Mika, Mika, Michelle Hayes. Hines, I think. Michelle. Uh, good evening. Fan from Georgia. U.S. state, not the country. E enjoy my first Iron Brew during the stream. Very good. We should all be enjoying Iron Brew during the stream. Moment, s someone hasn't got his Iron Brew out because someone else has decided to sit on top of it. Yes. There we go. No, you're not allowed any. <sighs> Uh, right then. This is all. I don't think Force Z did show uh, the superiority of aircraft carrier in any way. Basically, it theoretically shows the superiority of aircraft. Uh, actually, the interesting thing would be if Force Z had had an aircraft carrier with them, it could well have shown the, f the limitations of bombers and land attack aircraft to intercede with naval sh uh, with warships. Could have been kind of interesting because if it had been. And let's say one of the worked up armored carriers with an air group which would probably have featured veterans of the Mediterranean and radar, it would not have been pretty for those. Nels and Betty's were good, but against even full miles with veterans in, they would not have had much of a chance. Add in sea hurricanes and. Maybe some Buffalo Brewster Buffaloes coming in to support them, and it just doesn't get pretty, it just gets worse. Because, again, those aren't really aircraft you want in contested airspaces. Not if they're trying to make bombing runs on battleships. Um, Frank Turner, the US stays neutral, but lend leases its entire Navy to Britain. What does the US get in return? How does UK fare then? Um, 
Honestly, for their entire navy, what do we have to give them? South Africa? <laughs> um, we give them 50 bases for 50 destro for destroyers. Uh, that That's barely a lot of bases for 50 destroyers. Uh, that Canada? You know, the, 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 for the entire navy, that's going to be a lot. So it's going to they're going to ask for something massive. Uh, what would the Royal Navy do with the entire U.S. Navy? Well, goodness help Germany and Italy. D does it come with crew? Uh, is it just the ships? If it comes with crew, so basically it's a mercenary agreement. They all come fight under the British flag for you, like the Eagle Squadron or something. Well, hey, you know, we've now gained a whole load of carriers, which we can deploy to the Far East, and we will deploy shamelessly, because they're not really suitable for Mediterranean, but they're fine for the Atlantic, Indian Ocean, and Pacific. Uh, we've got armoured carriers going around. We have a whole slew of extra battleships. That's fun. Basically, you imagine the battle fleet we could give to Cunningham to go and hunt down the Italians. Would it be Iowa's, New Jersey's, and, you know, War Spite? It just, it just wouldn't be pretty. Perhaps he'd even get Admiral Lee as his deputy in command. We can imagine that. Ching Lee and Cunningham on the same, in charge of the same hunting group. Um, three minutes later. The Mediterranean is now cleared of ill enemy forces, sir. Very good. USS Washington, USS War Spite, both reporting they need new guns. Certainly. Um, yeah, it, it just, that's just not a good idea. That's just a way to write history into two largest navies in the world uniting to one command in 1939, 1940. No. And by the time the Japanese decide to do anything, that's just a lot of naval force. Seb Thompson. Hello, Stafford. Hello, Dirt Squad. Hello, Vader Enterprise. Kilo 19. Think a stable gun, fling, a gun platform is always handy. True, but cruisers can do that role. Frank Smarto. Couldn't you make a quick rundown of every World War II naval force A to Z was? Where, which were your favourites? Um, I've done this before, and I think I did it ab about my favourite one. Because I did an entire video about my favourite one. My favourite force, as a few of you will know, <laughs> my favourite one. Let me just get to make sure I get the link, and I'll get the link to the video. It was definitely not Force Z. It's Force H and Force K. And honestly, Force K is probably my favourite one. And I have done a whole episode on Force K. And let me just open up. That was one of the early episodes. Oh, my God, that was a long time ago. Oh, my beard looks so weird. But, yeah, um, Force K. I did like Force K. It's a it's it's an int it's a lovely force. It's probably one of the cool ones and one of the ones which really doesn't get enough attention. What are you doing down there? You are rearranging. Oh, you're rearranging the curtain. Okay. All right. Pop swaying us, are we? We're pop swaying it. Okay. So, the Royal Navy Task Force in World War II, the alphabet of ones, there's Force A, that originally is stationed at Malta, takes part in the Battle of Calabria, then transferred to Chimcom Lee and becomes the fast force of the Eastern Fleet during the Indian Ocean Raid. Force B, also originally stationed at Malta, also takes part in the Battle of Calabria and the Battle of Cape Spardavento, and is involved in the First Battle of Cert. And then moves to Trim and becomes the slow force made up of R-class battleships of the Eastern Fleet during the Indian Ocean Raid. 
Force C is actually formed during the Battle of Calabria. Uh, Force D is stationed at Malta and takes part in the Battle of Sparta Vento, Cape Sparta Vento. Force E... <sighs> There's very little details about. Force F was part of the hunting task groups, which are prelude to the Battle of River Plate. Um, in 1939, was stationed in Malta and takes part in the Battle of Cape Sparta Vento, apparently. Force G is all, is part of the hunting groups for the River Plate. Force H, of course, we know, takes as one of the hunting task groups for the Battle of the River Plate and uh, part of the South American Division, stationed at Gibraltar, takes part in Catapult, Runeberg, Harpoon, Husky, and Torch, another far larger one. Uh, Force I is stationed at Ceylon and also moves some troop ships around this part of River Plate actions. <laughs> Force J, Force K, there's a video there about that. Um, they're the major hunting for a task group for the Battle of Pre the Battle River Plate. And then there's Forces L, M, which are basically hunting things. M was originally under the command and of uh, John Cunningham and takes part in the Battle of D Dakar. Force Q was part of the covering force of Convoy PQ-13. And it was involved in the Battle of uh, Cherokee Bank. Uh, force R was based at Mamansk and involved in the Battle of Barents Sea and the attack on Convoy JW-51B. Force X was formed for the Harpoon and also involved in the attack on Mezel Kabir in 1940. And Force Y was part of the West Indies hunting group. And Force Z, as we all know, Singapore. The RN also has a few numbered task forces, and of course, originally they get task forces, uh, task forces fifty-seven and thirty-seven of uh, for the British Pacific Fleet. Although honestly, the British Pacific Fleet ignores those numbers so often, it really winds up the Americans. And Blue Show Butter. Good afternoon. Steph Thompson. Two things my uncle and I always have debates about. The need of gunships and flight decks for the RNC, uh, RCN. I'm sure you know which side I'm in favour of and he against. I'm explaining my views. Mm. Hello, Aaron B BT. Good afternoon from Virginia. Hello. Mike, uh, Michelle Hines. If Sir Walter Cohen was in command of Warspite at Narvik, is there any chance that he does not personally lead a landing force and retake the town? No. Sir Walter Cohen, uh, Cohen is one of those people who is going to jump ashore. It's kind of like if, in the nicest way, Philip Vian had been involved at Narvik. There is absolutely no chance that at some point they don't end up there. Um, so the fact that Co uh, that Cossack is in the command of Sherbrooke is probably a saving grace for the Germans. John Shea. Oh, wow, I didn't see the fr uh, fluffy researchers until he popped his head up. Yep, he pops his head around. He's currently asleep on the floor. But he will pop up for biscuits at some point. <laughs> um, Frank Smith, do we know what aircraft almost came out to try to save Force Z? Bruce the Buffaloes. They were the ones they were calling on. Dev Squad, Force Z shows that having your AA shells spontaneously disassemble at 30 degrees centigrade is a bad idea. An incoming fire is only scary if you know that it is incoming. Hmm. Rick Vassava. What if the USA stayed British like Canada and all of North America and North Mexico formed one big pro-British country? Uh, well, that's... Let's put it this way. That's not a scenario which Germany would enjoy because that means that's a very big pro-British country which gets involved in World War I from the beginning and gets involved in World War II from the beginning. Good evening, Albert Zavsky. Um, here's a question. Washington Naval Treaty allows the UK a third Asian fleet. How would you see it composed and how do you see it faring, even though it would, uh, would it be enough to deter Japanese? Okay, the only re way that happens if you get, is if you get an agreement of 12, 10, 7, i.e. the British get 12 for every 10 American for every 7 Japanese then that means the Americans can maintain five on either side. 
the Japanese will have seven, so technically they'll have superiority, but the British will have four in the Mediterranean, four in the Atlantic, and four in the uh, Indian Ocean. So if that works out, honestly, you see it as a thing of, you'd have to start working that out instead of the numbers and how that would affect things. I, would the British get... Well, under those points, you would probably be talking about the... You would see at least certainly some of the Admiral class completed as carriers. You would possibly see a far larger Nelson and Rodney class in that you would probably get three to f three to four of them built because that'd be the only way the British would have enough ships that could do to require modern cruising because they would need to be able to station a squadron of battleships in each one in each fleet and a squadron of capital ships which would mean they need about six capital ships for each fleet so let's say that means they require 18 capital ships at which point if the americans are getting 10 for every 12 that means they get five for every six which means they get 15 battleships the japanese would have seven for every 10 in terms of the the americans had or seven for every 12 so they get 11 um aircraft carriers wise the british would probably get 12 the americans would get allocated 10 and the japanese would get allocated seven let's just make lives easy for ourselves yes it's doable it is doable under that sort of scenario and it's the british would need to have more cruisers more destroy, more cruisers more destroyers more everything to constitute the fleet but would it act as a deterrent to the Japanese? Yes, because it would mean the British would have very near to double their fleet. The Americans would have more uh, have their fleet plus fifty percent. And in any scenario where they're fighting the Americans and the British in the Pacific, they're fighting nine to uh, for nine to seven, and that's before the British and the Americans br bring in any reinforcements. So, if they're just facing the British Indian Ocean Fleet and the American Pacific Fleet, they're fighting 9 to 7. If the British manage to bring anything in from the Mediterranean Atlantic, let's say they take each of those fleets down by a quarter, then the British strengthen up to 6. The Americans maybe also bring in a couple of uh, two fifths of their fleet from the, uh, from the Atlantic, so they got the seven, and they're fighting thirteen seven. Or maybe the British add in a bit more, and it's fourteen to seven. So it's two to one. Would it deter the Japanese? No, because they really didn't feel they had any options. But it might force them to try and negotiate earlier. It also might change the dynamics of the treaties and the alliance system. So that might have an effect. That's God. Cruisers versus two battleships, three or four carriers, and assorted other ships doesn't sound like it go well for the cruisers. No. It doesn't for the Japanese. Uh, let's see. Frank Spotter, I had read somewhere that Church's right-hand man in Pacific, General Lumsden, was killed in New Mexico. How did that happen? Can't really remember. I swear Derp Squad's question and Frank Spotter's question just popped up now. Um, <sighs> no, uh, hello, the club side desk. Well, yes, what's what was the No, the idea was the US Navy join with the Ro somehow all get assigned to the Royal Navy under lend lease. So it would be HMS Washington and HMS Warspite 
taking on the Italian Navy. N and Rigi, can't wait for the upcoming bi biography of Malik. We're all looking forward to it. Hello, Nook. G19, no 16-inch cruiser. Hmm. <laughs> New IKB-47, would you use Commerce Raider's scout plane to carry the biggest radio transmitter it can so it can fly away from the mothership and broadcast reports to increase radius of enemy RDF? Mm, be of any assistance? Yes, but only to, as long as the aircraft actually works. That's remember the problem with the, um, the aircraft on the grass bait. They've broken down by the time it was caught. Uh, Tovmin, hey, I get to catch one of these ones. Hello, Tovmin. Hello, Timmy Loka. Frank Swanner, not such a question. Were there Force A1 and so forth? No, it was Forces A, Forces B, Forces C. They're mainly hunting forces. John Shea, Chingley and Cunningham with War Spite, New Jersey in med. Yes, you just created a situation where the phrase brute force is not even close to describing it. <laughs> well, you know. Um, <laughs> at, least the, at least the Italians would. No, they went. They were the actually the major threats because if you're combining those two and putting, I don't know, Philip Vian in charge of destroyers and giving him a mixture of tribals and Fletchers, um, you you're just basically saying yes, you're the real threat, so we're going to take you out. Send me again. Have a good doctor. You're absolutely insane with the time of the videos you put out today. Uh, I'm just catching up. Thanks, Bonnet. Did the British use force at the Falklands too? Uh, too? Um, quite a lot of the forces were operating from the Falklands, but remember, the Falklands, they could only do self-maintenance out. George Shade, plus, who is next uh, the initiatives, uh, initiatives videos? Um, we've got a few coming up. Turnaround, here's a question. Abdacom, for some reason, does not force the Battle of Java Sea. What impact would this have on the campaigns in the region? I basically, they managed to avoid the Battle of Java Sea, so they're still around. Well, the, the question is, do they go and form up with the American forces down in the south and come that eventually come up through Southeast Asia? Or... We okay. Or do they form up with the British Indian Ocean Fleet? Either way, they could be a presence at Coral Sea and Midway, which could be interesting. An extra cruiser there could be useful. I would see the Asian Fleet made up of the older ships, to be honest. I doubt it, because supporting the older ships forward is going to be more difficult. And also, remember, the Asian fleet will be in the ocean, but expected to cover the Pacific, so they want the ships with the longest ranges. So, probably expect them to see battlecruiser heavy. You probably see it made up of the G3s and Hood. Or, no, probably Renowns and Queen Elizabeth's. With the Nels, uh, the Nelrod staying in the home fleet, and the rest of the ships forming the bulk of the remainder forces. So you would probably find your Pacific, your Indian, Indian fleet would be the two Renowns and four of the four of the Queen Elizabeths, or probably two, possibly two Renowns, two Queens, and two R's. With the rest of your squadrons, your ships being sort of formed up, you know, battleship heavy in the Mediterranean, battleship heavy at home with Hood in the home fleet. So, now, what if a nation like Thailand builds 10 or so Montana equivalents in secret and veils them in like 1912? What would the reactions of the other dreadnought building nations be? Ouch! Probably the Royal Navy would be sort of going, hmm, okay, we need to increase our production. Uh, Germany would be crying because they've just been supplanted. And America would also be crying. Uh, 
Take a look at it. About those Brewster F2A battleships and uh, didn't more. Since they were used by multiple parties, they were interesting. Both in terms of media and building new ships to counter them. If the if Thailand builds ten or so Montana equivalents in nineteen twelve, then everyone's going on a mass building spree. But the British expect the Queen Elizabeth class to have eight vessels ordered. And expect the R class to be not such a letdown. Right, sorry, which navy had the worst record of losing ships to accidents in World War II? How seriously did this impact operations? I think that's probably the German navy actually lost the most through accidents. Mainly because they were submarine heavy force, and that tends to leaven out your accidents, whereas. If you if you have an accident on a surface ship, you tend to be able to work around it. You have an accident on a submarine, you tend to be in trouble. If you hear some weird breathing, he's gone to sleep. He's made he, he's carved out of space for himself. Side side, the Panama, uh, the Panama Canal is built fifty feet wider. How does it affect U.S. naval design? Um, a lot of naval architects in the U.S. are suddenly very, very happy. E expect their ships to be built proportionally longer and slightly wide and a lot wider. Uh, Dope Squad. By the end of the Napoleonic Wars, if the U.S. had stayed British, Britain would be so powerful it would have been able to essentially control the entire world without any real resistance. Hmm, there is a possibility of that. That's good. The real question is whether Queen Victoria would tell uh, whether Queen Victoria tell Vince well, uh, von Bismarck resistance is futile. Um, if Queen Victoria actually came face to face with Bismarck, Bismarck would have been very, very worried. Frank Sonnet, was Churchill really the only man who managed to convince England to fight Germany? No, but he was probably the only option of the of the big political beasts in the Conservative Party to actually run the country at that point. There was a movie that makes it seem like that. There's movies that make it seem like all sorts of things. Also, did you like the touring movie? Um, it was an interesting one. This France all. I wouldn't think so. The global empire of Europe were driven to maintain European concerns. Supreme UK would be a threat for all. It'd be hard, uh, ha hard for to contest all European empires. Not really. You have to remember that the UK was primus into Paris. Paris. And the British were very careful to make it always seem like that. So even when they were actually quite a lot powerful than some of the other empires, they were very good at the diplomacy. I.e. they never flaunted they were so powerful. Rick Masada, what if the Japanese fleet was spotted a day away from Pearl? Then you have an interesting battle potentially take place at sea. If they're spotted a day away from Pearl you'd expect the U.S. Navy to probably have mobilized and be at sea, in which case there could be a battle of Pearl Harbor, could be a battle which takes place in the ocean, and, well, it might not have been good for them. This one, how useful do you see hovercraft being ordered to if it had matured by then? I'd wager very useful. For doing what? I I, see, uh, I I can understand your point, but what are they going to do that we, they don't already do in World War Two? The landing assaults? Well, let's be honest, you're never going to build as many hovercraft as you can build other landing craft. They're far more expensive and far more complicated. So, what are they going to be for? Commando raids? Great, but then you need to launch them. There are options, certainly. A hovercraft would be useful, but they'd be in niche roles. They wouldn't be a mass force of hovercraft. You certainly wouldn't get a landing craft air cushion like we have the US Navy sort of forces dependent upon, even though, to be honest, they still use landing craft utility for a lot of their heavy lift. Shumak, what things would, would need to have a massive cave system in a mountain island to naval base? I am determined to make this work in RP. I am, in, because a secret mountain base has massive bond villain energy. Sean Mac Can you 
retype the question because that's confusing me a bit. Trying to figure that one out. Hi, Night Hound Production. Car home. Hi. Sorry about being married, think Work is terrible, but holiday was heaven. I'm glad you have a holiday, good. Seneca, you know YouTube punishes you for more than two uploads in a day. They do? Uh, Dr. Dr. Trifonius. Hey there, Doctor. Hello. Just first of all, and even with British win, the costs of fighting everyone would be crippling. Shemak, I think if Abda Command survived and went with the US fleet, the largest impact is that the Allies would have surely won Savo via the method of filling the water with cruisers. Potentially. Now, here's a video idea. A video on key nations' naval shipyard capacities, both in production and maintenance quality. Hmm. Don't think. And the French Massage Town. Are those 10 Montanas bolted down? Well, that's the other option the Royal Navy might do. Hello, Greg Sassy. I seem to have missed the start. I started a little bit early. I think about a minute or two. Jimmy, what was the most uh, most decisive what if in British history? <sighs> well, I do sort of tend to favour actions in World War Two for being decisive because in nicest way what ifs because that's towards the end of things and it changes how the perception is. Whereas Age of Sail, if a battle doesn't happen, another battle tends to happen. So I'd say it's the Indian Ocean raid, because it's one of those cases of if Somerville had managed to score those hits, had managed to take out the Japanese vessels at night, then the Japanese fleet would have been in a very, very bad position. It really would have been. So we say Operation C in the Indian Ocean Raid. Senator, so, no, the thing is, Thailand is right next to India. They need a home fleet equivalent there now to defend it. And they will be building it. Animal BT, research stuff. A bit long in the tooth, Doctor. Um, I'd say more woolly. Next one. If all the important admirals, generals, politicians during one on were on the Titanic, who would go down with it? Dress like a woman to escape, or figure out a way to stop the sinking or losing many lives? Oh, Churchill's obsessed with hero uh, uh, heroism, so he'd probably be on it. Uh, uh, um... Jackie Fisher and Jellico were probably trying to work out what to do. BT would be being nutty. Um, let's see. US Admiral could be interesting. I'm not going to get into the French generals. But, um, yeah. Hmm. That's a sort of interesting question, but... Yeah. Sims will be the interesting one. If anyone's going to try and rebuild it, it's going to be Sims. He would try and fix it. So, I'd probably have the hell with Jellicoe, though. 
BT, oh god knows what I'm going to say is what BT would do. Honestly, there's no idea. Honestly, there's no idea what BT would do. BT could either decide to be many, many, many heroes or many, many different things. Uh, Adfab, given the recent series, any ideas about crazy bad ideas that worked? Uh, that could be a whole new series, and it's very tempting to make it a whole new series. Potter ending ga Ender Gaming. Hello, Doc and everyone. Hello, Captain Seaforce. Reaction to submarines. How many boats' lives do you think the loss of Amos Fetus saved with the introduction of Fetus Clip? <sighs> Hundreds of lives and dozens of subs. I don't know productions. There was a series called Unsolved History in 2004. They did an op an op episode on Pearl Harbor. It looked at the scenario where the US meets the IJN at sea prior to December 7th. Losses were worse than in real life. Surely it depends on who spots who first. The earlier scenario was if the US spots the Japanese a day away. If the US knows where the Japanese are, but the Japanese don't know where the US are, they, the US can launch a strike. Thanks, man. What was the recruiting like for the English during Between Wars and today? Um, they do okay. The British do okay in recruitment. It's always a little difficult in peacetime, but they tend to get there. I would say that's possible. However, as said, the US would not have industrialized if it was a part of the empire. Like Canada Ross, it would have lost uh, lost lots of raw supplies for uh, their own manpower. Would it have not industrialized? Canada or Australia had both industrialized. They had significant industries. They didn't have significant in military industries, but they had significant industrial for industri industries. They just hadn't needed the weapons industry or arms industry because that had come from Britain. Saying that though, this is America. I cannot imagine any scenario of America which does involve them investing in heavily in big guns. Great topic. Read Victoria and Bismarck. Perhaps more interesting is if the succession laws had allowed her to become Queen of Hanover. German unification would have been very different. Oh. <laughs> German unification might not have happened on those circumstances. Um, Adam Brady, watching Saigon 2.0 unfold here on the Pontiac, um, Ghost of General Elvis and Stone walks the planes once more. Sad day. Such a waste. Totally predictable. Yeah. Bill Trump's this week includes a lot of stuff talking about it. A lot of stuff. Death Squad, Death Clock. The hovercraft can be very useful landings in areas uh, thought to be safe and therefore very likely defended. An area with a few miles of swamp could be crossed in minutes. True, but think about that on the European coast. Where are those areas? Tommen, as you heard recently, the Dutch Navy has the rule to always have a ship named after Van Spijek uh, for blowing himself up rather than seeing his gunboat captured. What Brit Brit deserves a similar ship naming? That's the trouble. There are lots of Brits, uh, British sailors and officers you could make the case for. Sherbrooke would be one for me. But so would the captain of HMS Glowworm. Sure. Alright, so I have an island with a massive cave system, and I want to base ships out of there because it's really exceptionally cold. I'm wondering what challenges I could ha I would have with coal and oil-fired ships. Well, you probably want oil-fired ships because coal will have dust getting everywhere, which can go off in your and choke your co your cave system. Whereas oil, you can store far more efficiently. John, just wondering. I've been so busy with overtime at Mountain Warehouses. Bill Trump's been released this week. 
Not yet, because the episode we recorded that was supposed to go out this week was absolutely terribly acoustically. The sound was completely wrecked. So, we did some changes. Frank Swallow, thank you for the super chat. Thank you. Super chats are much appreciated, because at the moment, as I said, all this money, all the money uh, raised through YouTube and Patreon goes to funding my research trips. Frank Swallow, thank you for these lies, Doxy. Will your book cover in detail what the tribals did to the Bismarck? There is a whole section in one of the chapters on it. Rick Versailles, what if Sweden went to war against Germany when Germany invaded Norway? Good luck to the Germans. You don't want to fight the Swedes in cold. And that could have actually saved the Norwegian troops because it would allow them someone to go and withdraw to and recover. So Germany would have been fighting a bogged down guerrilla war in Norway, which is not a good idea, with the Swedes supporting it. And with their losses they'd already sustained, there's no chance of them doing an amphibious assault on Sweden. And that's definitely not a country you try and take by air power. Very salty. Coal should not have any problems. Oil you probably need to preheat to be able to pump effectively. Depends. If you're away from the surface frost and you're inside your cave system and you're keeping your cave system habitable temperature anyway for the humans inside, that should be okay enough for keeping the oil moving. Hey, just so. Napoleon's Egyptian expedition sunk, captured before arrival. That would have been interesting, but it depends on then who takes over France, if not Napoleon. Because someone will. That's the way their situation is set up. That someone is going to end up taking over France. The question is who? That's no, gone. Possibly. Both Canada and Australia were at least partially industrialized. Also, having such a large area would require a higher level of industrialization in the American colony. Yes. Sam Thompson, what if the treaty cruisers were limited to 12,500 tons instead of 10,000 tons? Would the Japanese have had an 18,000 ton heavy cruiser in the end? Quite possibly, but um, they would have needed that to be able to beat a 12,500 ton cruiser. Because you imagine, if you've got an extra 2,500 tons, imagine what you can do with a county class. Imagine what you can do with a town class. Let's be honest. Let's take a town class cruiser and make it two and a half thousand tons bigger. What is that thing going to be capable of? <whistles> Shemak, I already have some hybrid tugs icebreakers under construction. I'm reinforcing the cave entrance site since the uh, entrance uh, since the site is geologically active, which is this whole scheme will work. Uh, which is why this whole scheme will work in the first place. Hmm. Strong. Do you think tech would have advanced as quickly if World War II ended quickly, i.e. in 1943? Probably. Possibly would advance quicker, because remember, in wartime, you shift from research to develop brand new tech to research to actually implement the tech you're developing. So it's rare new things appear in war in terms of new technologies. They're usually being developed pre-war. It's just they're turned into something pra practical to use. Whereas in the in pre-war, you're spending time developing stuff which you might not be able to use, might not be able to use. You don't know. It's brand new technology. The thing is, a Navy damage control team could have saved, uh, couldn't have saved the Titanic. Possibly not, because it doesn't remember have any bulkheads going across the top. So that's the thing. It has bulkheads lengthwise along the hull. It doesn't have bulkheads stopping the water flow going up and over. So that's the problem. M55 Bennett, sorry mate. I was following recent events in Afghanistan. It's happening quickly. Ms. France, question on the fissure. I find he tends to be maligned somewhat. I consider him fairly. He has some crazy ideas or ideas that don't pan out. But at least he tried to uh, to try and to invigor the RN. Yeah, he worked hard. 
Buggy two hundred and nine. Hello. How would World War One go if the US is in, uh, US entered in the beginning? If the US entered into World War One in the beginning, then you have the US Army probably deployed to the Western Front very quickly and starting building up, which means you get that huge surge of American troops coming in in 1915, in which case the Germans are going to be looking at a huge overwhelming numbers facing them in 1915-16. So, Reholocraft, if they would have been even more developed, I see a Sergeant Bilko such as the film situation happening. Potentially. That doesn't have to call about some truck tires and might be headed out to get them. Good luck. Good luck with the cutting of the, uh, the friend's property. Regarding industrialization of the dominions, this only started in the 20th century and was not super invested in. It was in British interest to get the colonies to buy British made goods. True, but America is not really Russian. This front rule, the US only has really started in industrialization following the War of 1812, as it could no more buy British industrial goods. It actually was still buying them quite a lot. And you can tell this because look at where quite a lot of the railway engines, which made um, were very critically important to the uh, American Civil War, uh, came from. Nigerian production, the captain who refused to surrender his gunboat to the Japanese Hong Kong? Certainly an option. That's good. I was thinking more about the Pacific with the crossing swamp idea. But in Europe, there's a few places in Italy and South France that have swampy coastal areas. Yes, but if you're launching an invasion from Britain, why are, why are you going round to Italy? Trumac. Sounds like hovercraft would be useful in Burma. True. But again, that's a kind of specialist area if you think about the wider war. Pete Dawson. The US then press ganged a 60 year old in the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. Timu Locker. What if the US had a stronger presence in the Falklands in the early 80s? Would the Argentinians dare to launch an attack attack? Probably not. In the nicest way, they're waiting for a reduction before they launch the attack. So if there'd been a stronger force, i.e. you kept a battalion-sized force there, also they'd have had to bring a lot more troops there to deal with. So if you'd had a battalion-sized force reinforced by a squadron of aircraft and a battery of gun, artillery guns, they probably decided they had better things to do that day. Next one, is there an official name for the battle where Bismarck was defeated? It's usually considered the hunt for the Bismarck and the sinking of the Bismarck. Um, there isn't really an official name as far as I understand it. Another Dutch what if. The Germans decide to keep the Dutch neutra neutrality in World War II. How would this affect operations in the North Sea? If the Dutch are a neutral, for, uh, a neutral nation in World War II, it would mean there's a gap in operations and sort of there's a gap in air, the space where aircraft have to go round, can't fly over. It would also be interesting because you'd have to have neutral ships passing through a minefield. The poor Dutch would be in a nightmare scenario. It would be nightmare, really, but... Hmm. That's Trifonius. On 12,500 tons, you can fit 12 times 8 inch, me thinks, with decent armor to boot. Um, 
Possibly not, but you can probably get 10 times 8 inch. You could maybe get 15 times 6 inch. Frank Sonic, what would Fisher, Jellicoe, BT, Nelson, Cunningham, Nelson, Churchill, Cunningham think about the Beatles and British culture in the 60s, 70s, and 80s? I have no idea. Knowing BT, he'd have been dancing to it all. Retrophonies. New technologies are invented pre war and developed into practical stuff for wartime hunts. True, as said. Like medicine tech now, as Sonic Nero points out. Sonic Nero, uh, a ton of medical tech gets implemented now with the funding from governments due to COVID. Mm hmm. Thanks for that. General Pershing at Verdun. That would be an interesting scenario. I don't think he would tolerate the French. Next one, what occurred in the RN to need officers to follow the letter of the order and not just the spirit, which would later lead to Victoria sinking with Camperdown? Basically, peacetime. And egos. Peacetime and egos. Because you have to remember, in peacetime, military suffered from the same thing all organisations do. They start to become very risk-adverse, very worried about the image. And basically, the idea is if you follow the letter of the orders... You're less likely to make a mistake. Trouble is, then at a certain point, you're the one giving the orders and you don't know what to do because you're so used to following the letter. Sam Canary. German Bundesmarine Navy wants to build a big new ship and now name it. Now name it after a state, but a cat. Uh, not na now name it after a state, but a captain. Not name it a state, but a captain or admiral from the past. Who the best option? Bond Spay. The Grass Bay. You can't have a better option than that, really. Why didn't Sweden go to war when Norway was invaded, and why did they feed the German war effect? Well, first reason was, did they expect any support? They just seen Norway conquered. Two, Norway didn't ask them. There was already an interesting relationship between Norway and Sweden, because remember, some several points, Norway has been actually been under the occupation of Sweden, so interesting relationship going on there. And money. Timo Luka, what would have been the state of your son if Ching Li had not died? Um, interesting. You would, he would probably have been heavily involved in the revolt of the admirals post-World War II, and probably been very, very senior in all the things that happened. So you might have had a sort of pre-version of what Ali Burke does to the US Navy. Does God, Timo Locke, Dr. Clark, the Argentine Junta might have attacked the Falcons anyway. Argentine population was beginning to organise against them, and they desperately needed a distraction. Yes and no. Uh, they needed a distraction, but they could have just easily gone to war with Chile. And a re properly reinforced and secured Falkland Islands with a garrison a la what we have today would be a lot less attractive than Chile, where they might win something. Frank Sweater, why are the missing after a battle not counted as KIA and killed in action even decades later? Well, to an extent, it's administrative, but also it's relation to the fact that people can suffer tr truly horrendous in injuries in battle, and if you're not sure they're dead, you don't know where they are. So you put them as missing, because you cannot confirm their status. Because that's their true status, they are missing. You can't confirm them as killed in action, because you don't know. You never saw them dead. You haven't found their body.
Um, Bad Guy 8829, would a Jutland star battle happen or would the High Seas Fleet mutiny happen earlier if the USN was working the RN to start a battle at war? Probably a Jutland star battle would still happen, but um, as honestly the US Navy wasn't that amazing at the beginning of World War One, but when it did eventually happen, um, you might well have found a very, very big Navy fighting there. Uh, honestly, it the the thing is you uh, the the Germans would have been even more outmatched in numbers and who knows how much damage they have sustained who is the black prince the black prince it's quite a cool character i'm just remembering which his father, uh, which one was his father? It was Edward the Third. Yes, he was eldest son of Edward the Third. And I talked about Edward the Third before. Now, unfortunately, he died before his father. He's also known as Edward Woodstock. And he was one of the most successful commanders during the Hundred Years' War. He was a really, really successful general. He was the first Duke of Cornwall. And guarding the king's absence in the, of the kingdom in his father's absence three times, created Prince of Wales in 1343, and knighted by his father at La Hogue in 1346. He commanded the Battle of Vanguard at the Battle of Crecy, and took part in the Calais expedition. Uh, he served the king's lieutenant in Gascony. And led an army into Aquitaine on Chevash. And of course, he famously won the Battle of Poitiers, where he routed the French and took King John prisoner. And that's, of course, uh, King John of II of France. So, a fairly successful gentleman. Bum, 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 bum. And back to the questions. Night Aaron Productions. Here's a question you'll hate. You can pass over if you like. A new Bismarck movie. Who do you cast in some of the key famous roles? My Achilles heel, naming actual ac uh, na and actual actors. Um, you've got to get Patrick Stewart in there somewhere, just because it's fun. Not sure who I'd have him play though. And hmm, probably the guy who played uh, the two guys from Sherlock. That's the British version. And David Tennant at some point. I need some decent German actors. Again, I can't remember any names for the life of me, so I'm probably terrible at that question. Um, <laughs> Next one, Eric Wilkin Brown. What aircraft would not fly? He basically would fly anything. Put him in an aircraft. I, I'm fairly sure, even to his end, he would anything he put him in his it, he'd fly he'd fly it. Yes, yes, yes. Now, Doctor Lahart, Grassface was my first thought, but also the ship of Grassface, uh, also the ship Grassface captain Lungersdorf, it's become better known on in Germany in recent years, but still technically worked for the Nazis, so probably still technically verboten. Therefore, Grassface probably easier. That's awesome, Doctor Lahart. Thank you for your wishes. Good luck. 
Thank you for your Twitter tagging. It's fun. Ages though, reminds me of a song Grandma would sing. 1,000 Swedes ran through the weeds, chasing one Norwegian. 1,000 Swedes ran through the weeds, chased by one Norwegian. <laughs> Again, that wouldn't surprise me. Why black? As Captain Seafall's put, colour his armour. He liked to have black armour, but also he was considered to have a bit of a black sense of humour. Trez, honestly, did the British need US naval support in World War One? Would have been a nice bonus, but it's worth is it worth the complexity of a multinational command structure? Um not really, but it could have been fun. And they eventually turn up anyway, so you might if you're gonna integrate them anyway. Basically, uh, to be honest. The British would have found a way to use them. Because remember, if the Americans come with some of their newer ships, that allows the British to dispatch some of their older dreadnoughts elsewhere. Which might free up, let's say, some of the more pre-dreadnoughts from the Channel Fleet to go and do nasty things in the Mediterranean. So this is the point. It's all about logistics and where do you want where is best to put certain ship passes. Bud Guy 8829, how would a submarine heavy German Navy leading up to and in World War I affect the other navies in naval development? Um, if Germany is building a submarine heavy fleet, expect the other navies to be responding by building an anti submarine fleet. And expect that to be capable of part of their capabilities. But also, honestly, there are limits to what Germans can do with submarines. There's a limit to the technology available in World War I. So yes, that would be fun. That would be an interesting force to deal with, but it wouldn't be an impossible force. Again, as I always explain, you do not at naval. When I see someone saying, "I what happens if you build a submarine heavy navy?" It's like if you ask me, "What happens if someone builds an artillery heavy army?" Artillery is the most powerful weapon on the battlefield. It is the big gun, the big killing machine of any army. So it makes sense to build an artillery heavy force. However, if you have an artillery heavy force and I look at, see you coming with an artillery heavy force, then I've got options. I could make very fast moving like cavalry that will get close and take out your artillery. Or I could build a force structured around Apaches or any sort of gunships. Or I could... There's a range of options. The whole point is the greatest risk comes from facing a balance force, not an imbalance force. Seneca Nero, back to the time on Tannis. What would the reaction of British India be to the following, uh, following unveiling, and what would the reaction be in Indochina? Uh, basically, the European powers would be scrambling to get ships out there. They have 10 Montanas. That's going to be fun. They'll deal with them. But honestly, and this is the point I find it's the most problematic with you. Is how would they keep that construction secret from anyone? The sheer amount of armor, the sheer plates, the sheer amount of engineering skill and nuance, the construction facilities, all those things. Do you think the Royal Navy doing all those, sh all those port visits are not going to notice them? Right, so should the RN use the Black Prince name again? Yes. As for the reaction of India following the unveiling, uh, expect the British India in India to be worried, but are the Thai going to suddenly start with a massive army to try and take India? Probably not. Also, 10 battleships are great. How many destroyers do you have? Do you have submarines? Do you literally just have 10 battleships? In which case... We can probably deal with that. Please speak. Conte de Cavour with German radar. Nightmare for the RN? 
I would point out what happens to German radar as a habit when fighting the British on the, the RN. The British tend to manage to hit it with something and lock it out. Usually a six inch shell. German radar is also quite sensitive. So yes, it would be a theoretical nightmare. Practically, probably dealable with. I was asking, if Black Prince was so successful, then why name one of the worst British tanks after him? I never said the British are nice to the people who are their heroes. Seneca Nero, I have no idea what that means. So, uh, Captain C4, Dr. Fronis, there wasn't a complicated command structure. Sixth Battle Squadron was treated as an integral part of the Grand Fleet. Pretty much it's the easiest way to deal with them. Uh, that's how you deal with the Americans. You make them a battle squadron. It's like how the Americans deal with the British in the Pacific Fleet. They make us a task force. That's good. In the eyes of the Argentine junta, if they attack Chile, both the US and UK will get involved anyway to protect their investments in Pinochet and Chile. Mm, yes, but they fought wars with Chile and the Americans and Brits tend to only get involved once they feel it's got a bit messy. Otherwise, otherwise, they leave it for a while, quite happily. Frank Warner, what do you think of Oscar Wilde? Hmm. There are better and there are worse. In World War What Two, did the Germans try to innovate with submarines or try to stamp out many of a few different models? Um, depressingly, they tried, to, well, they were both stamping out many of the same models, so that's why Type 7 has so many builds, but they did try and innovate, mostly by nicking stuff which the Dutch have been developing. That's good. Argentine Junta at the time was costing the US money. Pinochet being in power and was making them money. It'd have been a pretty simple choice. You'd think so, but they, and this is the Cold War period where everyone was worried about Russians on the bed. Dr. Frenis, some Marines are like horse archers. Modern war gamers tend to overestimate their capabilities. Yeah, horse archers are very, very cool, right up until they get caught in a place where they can't maneuver. Frank Warner, my favorite tanks are the Valentine, Crusader, and Cromwell. Where am I wrong? Not really wrong, but, you know, Matilda is cute. Seneca, okay, that is fair. You can't keep that kind of stuff secret. Those are the new container ships. <laughs> yeah, doesn't really work. I would say the greatest risk comes from facing a balanced force that is also specialised in some way. The US Army in World War II was very balanced, but also had the best artillery. Really? <laughs> Nicest way, the German artillery was no slouch, the Russian artillery was definitely no slouch, and the British artillery wasn't that bad. Japanese artillery... Mm was fairly decent as well. I don't think anyone can really claim to have out-and-out -out best artillery. They have some units which are better than others, they have some guns which are better than others, but it depends on what caliber you're talking about, what size of artillery, are you talking about light guns, medium guns, heavy guns, rocket artillery, all these things. There are arguments made for all of them. Sure, what's German radar like most other things that German's made? Uh, Approximately 10% better, twice the cost, and 10 times more complex. Pretty much. Senator Canary, you can give any non European independent nation in 1912 a World War II or a Navy. Who do you think give it to, to, to cause the most, check, uh, most chaos, excluding Japan?
the Ottoman Empire. Because that'll freak everyone out. <laughs> it would. The other option would, of course, be Brazil. But that would be mainly to wind up the Americans, because if a Brazilian suddenly had... It was bad enough when the Brazilians got the battleships they did get. If they'd suddenly had ten Montanas, goodness gracious me, the US Navy would have been getting funding coming out of his eyeballs. <laughs> <laughs> but the Ottoman Empire would probably cause the most trouble because that would be a direct threat for the British to the Suez. It would upset the Franca, French, Italians, Austro Hungarians, and the Russians. Uh, it would cause the Americans to be worried because, again, they'd be dropping down the list. It would cause the Germans to be worried because, well, in the nicest way, their main entry into them into. The Middle East is because the Ottomans depend upon them. If the Ottomans suddenly have 10 of these battleships, to what need do they have for the Germans? No, it's, it's the Ottoman Empire is probably the most chaotic, but the mm, Brazil probably the most funny. Adrian, hello, evening doc. I was under the impression that whilst the SAS and SOE were not directly his ideas, Churchill sure did look favourable on both of those organs and acted as the champion for them. Is this not correct? It is pretty much correct. And the SBS and a whole range of other special forces. But honestly, if I want to go down that rabbit hole, then I better be prepared for a long, long rabbit hole. But guy 1829, what if Hitler doesn't declare war on the US after the attack on Pearl Harbor? You have problems. But if functionally the Japanese have declared war on both the British and the Americans, so the British and Americans are combined in fighting the Japanese, at a certain point the Germans are going to feel the wrath of the Americans. Captain C4, free balance forces. A quote I remember from the US Navy field manual was A good commander to present the enemy with dilemmas, not problems. Seems a good summary of the concept. Pretty much. Adfab, given the joys of uh, Patagonian politics, should the UK invite the Chilean Navy to have port visits to Port Stanley? Um, I think we already do. Timothy, I uh, we have all heard about ships' cats, but being a dog person as well, I'm curious, are there any famous naval dogs? <whistles> well, are there any famous naval dogs? I know you're getting a snooze, but I'll be good. You're not getting up. You just want a biscuit. Okay. There you go. Have the biscuit. Good boy. Well, there's the fluffy research assistant, but um, there are many. There are a few pictures going around there, but there aren't really that many famous dogs. And speaking as a dog person. Frank Sonic, what are those things called? Um, I'm fairly sure what you're referring to on the Cromwell tank are the rivets. Disruptional. Um, not now. Pinochet is fondly remembered by most. Not fondly remembered by most, and Chile is on the side of anti colonization. Um. Actually, the, the, the Chile is actually still very pro British. You know, Pinochet might not be well remembered, but they like the birds still. Uh, in my experience of dealing with them, and yeah. So anyway, I'm not talking about only ten Montanas. I'm talking about a balanced World War Two era navy. If you suddenly got a balanced World War Two era navy, you're going to watch a rapid, and I mean a massively rapid development of European naval technology, because that would just be. Mm. That's good. Given Brazil, uh, give Brazil a World War Two Navy in 1912. World War Two would get interesting, given that USS were, uh, US were paying Brazil not to join the Axis until at least 43. Um, I think you've got your uh, our South American countries wrong about who they were paying not to join um, the Axis, and the US Navy was a US were paying money to Brazil to support the 
pan not a pan American neutrality zone. But honestly, Brazil was a major part of that, and Brazil was probably more pro-British. Argentina was the pro-Germany one in World War Two. Next matter: In war, did ships operate by the modern peacetime standard of freeze? I thought more ships were up and active far more often. It still works out of roughly three. They try and push it as much as they can, but still roughly it works out in thirds. Thanks, Connor. For every admiral you add to your navy, what must be added to the fleet to require another person in that rank? It depends on time and era, and it depends on what you're doing. If you have a lot of ships doing independent operations, you can probably get by with a limited number of admirals. If you have a lot of groups doing task group operations, you're going to need admirals. So if you have a lot of fleets and a lot of formations and a lot of things which require major decisions being made, i.e. you're procuring millions upon millions of pounds of warship every year, you probably want someone of quite a lot of experience running that. So that's what makes an admiral, or requires an admiral. Senator, if Norway fails, does D-Day happen earlier? And did a Western ally stand in Warsaw in 1943? If Norway fail, if Norway fails for the Germans, then there's an issue because they just lost Norway. Um, that will definitely affect the Battle of the Atlantic and any potential future battle of the Arctic or Arctic convoys. You then have the scenario that Germany's probably lost a significant chunk of their surface fleet and some of their elite troops in Norway. Uh, it could well affect their operations in France. It could slow them. It might not, but it could. It could give a lot more confidence to the British and the French and the Allies as a whole, because they'd have had a big victory. Which would stop the Germans feeling so, defeat uh, so uh, invincible which might well stop the battle in the French minds going quite so far so quickly. So, yeah, it, it, it's all a complicated... It, it, basically, Norway is the biggest what-if of World War II. You can war game it, but Germany fails in Norway. Norway ends up probably a member of the Allies, fighting fully alongside the Allies. I wouldn't be surprised if Sweden ends up being neutral but very benevolent to the Allies, as will be buying the iron ore through Narvik. And then that has a big impact on operations, you know. What's going on? Who's fighting who? How they're fighting? Uh, if you've got... If you're able to set up air bases in both Britain and Norway... And you can keep the long-range maritime patrol aircraft just circling between the two. You can probably start running a convoy system north of that patrol line quite quickly. Which means you can have regular supplies going back and forth between Britain and Norway. Which means with a little bit of work you could well end up with supporting bomber bases in Norway to bomb Germany. And that could have a big impact on World War II. And remember, Norway can build their own machine gun bullets and all those things, and bombs, if necessary, so they could supply them. But with enough fighters coming in from Britain, you could end up with a sort of Battle of Norway and Battle of Britain going on at the same time, which could really drain German forces. Although it probably means there's a, a, a huge, um, far more battles, far more, far more air war uh, in bombing going on over Denmark. You might end up with a Copenhagen 3.0 as well. Sure, Mac. I'm not saying other nations are bad artillery, but the US, from our reference, is the best at coordinating fire and had the VT fuse. I'm afraid, as Tis France would point out, the VT, the variable timing fuse wasn't new. It was 
part of Order 1. And the proximity fuse that they had a lead on was, again, not necessarily new. Um, there were others who, who were working on a proximity fuse. It's just implementation of it. Um, okay, 8829. If radar wasn't up till 1950, how would it affect things like the loss of the Battle of Britain? Well, you have to remember, Britain doesn't isn't relying on radar necessarily at the beginning of the Battle of Britain. They had the Observer Corps, and so they still do have some form of warning inscription coming in. It's not as good as radar, but they still have some. So... Basically, expect to see a lot more focus on things like visual range finders, on maybe those listening stations would actually be fully developed. All sorts of different options would come in to take the place of radar. Would they be as effective as radar? No. Might they be effective enough? Mm, who knows? You, we didn't do it. Let's go. The problem with ship's dog is that dogs tend to need more attention. Has anyone told the fluffy research assistant this? Senator, Argentina was pretty pro German, hence why they had a fair number of Germans with Argentinian grandpas. And. Argentinians with German grandpas. Um, this front, Greg Sassi. This front, they're useful to burst shrapnel shells a fixed distance above the ground. The US used them to great effect during the bulge and in the Pacific. Yes. As did British artillery. Various options. Um, I think you'll find the British artillery were using that trick in Italy, and we're also using that tr that thing in some of their battles in North in Northern Europe. That's good. My understanding was both Brazil and Argentina were pretty, relatively pro accent access. Brazilian gun was seeing the war as an opportunity to gain contested colony territory in the North. Not really. Brazilian government were not that proactive. There were, certainly were proactive factions within the Brazilian government and in the Brazilian political system. But... Not really the government as a whole. They were far more pro-British, and they worked with British a lot. Especially in World War One, And in World War Two to an extent, they were very helpful. Hence the Graf Spey episode and the speed of the helping the the, the fueling of various ships, etc. Um, for example, what was the prince and what was Princess Diana like? Um, I never met her. I was probably five, six years old when she uh, when she died. Maybe a bit older. I can't remember exactly. It's not true, but I will start with standard with VT fuses. Model 1 artillery crews, cr crews could do that in uh, standard practice. It was just maths on the bombardiers' part. And VTs were a lot cheaper. True. Tobias GR3Y. Aircraft carrier Norway. Mm, to an extent. Okay, 8829. Russia stays out of both world wars. How does that affect things? It's hard to see how they stay out of World War II. They might choose not to invade Poland. But that doesn't mean the Germans won't invade them. So let's say the Germans decide not to invade them. Then the British don't have to support Russia. We don't have to run the Arctic convoys. That makes life a little easier.
We also don't have to do the convoy supplies through to Iran and up from Iran up to Russia. Um, yeah. There's a lot of supplies going around and extra sh stuff to be used. We might well reinforce Singapore far more, so that way in World War Two. In World War One. You probably don't have Gallipoli. Because the whole reason to do Gallipoli and the Dardanelles is to get to Russia. If you don't have to do that, well, let's put it this way. You might well have an extra 15 inch battleship wandering, or a super dreadnought wandering around at the Battle of Jutland, which could have an interesting impact. So, yeah. Frank Swan, what are your favourite ships, crest, or shield from Model 2 today, history? Um, probably HMS Nubians. It's pretty cool. Cadron, where was Copenhagen 2.0? Uh, there have already been, there have been two battles of Copenhagen. Uh, there was the eighteen oh one and eighteen oh seven are the battles of Copenhagen. Nelson was involved in the first, and Wellington was involved in the second. Helpfully enough. Senator, are there even any resources left for Operation Barbarossa after a failed Norway in the scenario you described? Um, some, but it's mostly land battles forces. And remember, they don't use a lot of the land forces involved in Bar uh, for Barbarossa in Norway. They would just have lost a lot of good people. Uh, Frank Swan, Sean Mack, Dirt Squad, how good was the Cromwell? It was a fairly decent tank for its time. Frank Swan, do you own any piece of physical naval, his uh, naval history that's personally, nationally, globally important? I have a lot of family medals which are important to me. As for the rest, if I do buy stuff that's of nationally or globally importance, um, I would probably follow my um, granddad's habit with that, if I ever did it, which I, you know, which is that it's donated and it's donated by an anonymous person. Because that's my family way. Um, team Looker, what if the Finnish Navy would have proper ships before World War II? Would stand there to attack? He probably still tried it. I swear, your, your Stanley is not the most sensible strategic thinker. He isn't. And so he probably still tried it. He wouldn't have got he'd have got even less far, but he'd have still tried it. Ring of Arsava. I know you've mentioned this, but what was with the French Navy not joining the British after the fall of France, like other countries did? Was this due to pride or arrogance? And if they did, what difference would it have made? Uh it would have been useful. Those extra ships would have been, come in handy, especially in the Mediterranean. And they would have certainly freed up more ships because if you had more battleships and more things, you it's going to sound strange. Having more gener a, a larger mass generates more efficiency because it enables you to go things like, well, would Hood have not been sent in for a refit if they'd had the French? She probably would have been because... Yes, they still needed all the battleships they could get, but they could have spared Hood to go and get a refit because they had the Dunkirks and 
various other ships. So this is the point, really. You have, if you have the French, it's useful. Plus, it's part of the treaty they agree with France. And they and the part of the treaty they agree with Germany. They basically, instead of, they actually agree a peace treaty with Germany rather than doing what the others did, which was they were taken over, but they were still fighting. Sure, first one, Alto. Uh, I personally, I'm not a fan. I personally think they would have been better sticking the Sherman, but I'm a Sherman fanboy, so that take that with a grain of salt. I like the Cromwell. It's got good. It's got good ground clearance, and I like having the varieties because it makes the Germans have to worry more when they're fighting the British, uh, fighting the various allies. Seneca, so, how useful would be a battleship main gun be at hunting ducks while loading the gun with buckshot? Um, seriously, Seneca Nero, you, as Greg Stasky says, you wouldn't find many of the ducks afterwards. You also probably wouldn't find many of the trees. Pretty much anything vegetation, and probably not anything human or animal for a long way. A long, long way. You wouldn't so much aim it as an individual duck as aim it at a pond or a section of lake and wipe it all out. So, Negron, how useful would a 60 inch canister shot be against Age of Sail ships? Again, Pretty much shred anything on their decks, which was, especially if it's buckshot, uh, spread uh, anything which was made of organic material. Right, Spider, before the century, what was the UK's best to thank? You probably have to pick between one of the infantry tanks, the Churchill, the Valentine, maybe the Matilda. Arguably, the Matilda is one of the best tanks at the beginning of the war, but she's overtaken. Hi, Sarah Mason. Hello. Uh, evening all. I'm sorry, mate. Here's the fun one. I hope it's 18. Eh, I hope it's 1860, and Austria, France, and Russia team up against Britain, Prussia, and Italy. Ouch! Well, France and Austria are going to be in a lot of trouble. Russia isn't going to be having fun. The Royal Navy is pretty much going to go around the world wiping out French colonies and the French Navy. The Italian Navy is going to wipe out the French in the Mediterranean, probably with the Royal Navy's assistance. Um... And Russia, France, and Austria are going to get the uh, the joy of fighting the Italian army, Italian and Russian armies. The raw, the British army might well be landed at certain points in northern France. But from that group, they pretty much have to knock out France, and they knock out the rest too. That's got probably the comet. That's eh, a very good tank. Come on, a tad late. Read ground visual audio based early warning instead of radar. It worked for Chanel's flying targets, so it's good enough. It is. Frank's on it before late 1944. Hmm. Turn to Lanka. What if IJ and IJ chose to isolate an Australian new of Midway? Yes, it all goes south when the Essex one arrives. Kido Batai without the losses of Midway and Solomon's campaign in 1944. Wow. Um. If they chose to isolate Australia in lieu of Midway, well, you might then get a combination of, if they're trying to isolate Australia at the length and extent of their logistics chain, then you have an opportunity for the British East India, 
Eastern fleet to combine with the American fleet and both come together and come south. They might well break into Southeast Asia, similar points, and come south to take on the IJN. Because if they take out the IJN, then the IJA, wherever it is, where, wherever it's garrisoned, is just cut off. Bud guy 8829, would the RN do much in the Mediterranean if there was no Suez Canal? What do you think? No. No. Um, honestly, probably wouldn't care much about it. We'd have Gibraltar and we'd seal up the Mediterranean every time anyone was being annoying to us. Tevrain, the Type 31 do not get to be called after places. What theme would you like to go for their naming? I know travels is sadly not politically correct anymore. I would have gone for battles, but they've gone for emotions. What I'm calling them. Be Dawson, what's Italy? In 1860s, it does get formed, so we'll, get, we'll, get, we'll give that one. Thanks, Mark. Take all the tank types in desert against Rommel in 1940 uh, and have them in France in 1940. What changes? Well, the British are probably about as efficient as ever in the battle. Um, you might well find the Germans lose and have a lot more casualties. Especially there's a couple of tank battles where they have casualties anyway when they run into British tank columns. Um, so the Matildas are no slouches, even the original ones. Because their gun is one of the best anti-tank guns in the world. Mm. How, tis first of all, how do you see has uh, seen China develop if it was more respective to Westernization? The rejection of buying British manufactured goods led to the sale of opium, which was very harmful. Um. Because that was the only thing we could sell them to get the, to buy the stuff we wanted to buy off them. Um, it would be interesting. It would be interesting to see what happened. China is an interesting case study in what not to do on many occasions. But if they had, while they were still relatively strong, embraced trading with the outside world and buying ideas and developing themselves much more, and managed to sustain the infrastructure and to create their own industrial model, China could quite easily have become a very, very powerful nation very early on. They could have been a very, very powerful nation in the 1920s and 30s. Instead of the, basically being beaten up by everyone. Tobias GF3Y. Uh, it's a Toronto topic of France. I was wondering who would win in a showdown? Riclou, Jean Bart, or T Bism Bismarck Tim T uh, Tirpitz? Well, let's go over their stats first. Now, the Riklo class are finally built in a uh, complete in 1955. So, in the nicest way, their design configurations are what we'll go for. They were going to display, displace 37,850 tons. Uh, they had a length. of 247.85 meters and a beam of 33 meters and a draft at full load of 9.9 .9 meters so pretty much 10 meters their top speed was 32 knots their range was nine and a half thousand nautical miles that's 15 knots and they carried eight 15 inch guns in two quadruple turrets
They carried nine six inch guns and 12 3.9 inch AA guns. Their belt was 12.9 inches thick, their main deck was 6.7 inches thick, and their turrets were 17 inch, had 17 inches of armor. 17. The conning tower had 13 inches. And they carried four seaplanes. They are pretty darn cool under any circumstances in terms of firepower capability, but they do have all fire forward guns. However, they avoid the thing that really, really annoys me about the Nelsons and Romneys in that they are uh, Nelson and Romney in that they only have two guns. Let me get you a picture up of her. So You did not, did you? Oh, good lord. Sorry. I'm going to have to open a window in a second. <laughs> You've been eating sprouts. We are going to have words. So I'm just going to get these pictures up, and then I will open a window, and then I'll answer this question. Oh, good lord. And here is the Bismarck. And add another source. Here is the Auricolo. Now, she's been my life the window. Oh my god, what have we been feeding you? Must open window. Must open window. Must. Why now you get up? Seriously. Up. Window is not opening. Sorry about this. I have no idea what we're feeding him. I don't. What are we feeding you? He didn't look like me that. You, you just, you let it off. So, the Bismarck weighs in at 50,000 tons fully loaded. Turpits, 52,000 tons fully loaded. Uh, Bismarck has a range of 8,525 nautical miles at 19 knots, but a top speed of 30 knots. I know, you need to make a fuss of me now, after that. Ha also has 8 15-inch guns, but has only 4x2, rather than 2 quadruples. And let's see, bulkheads on the Bismarck. 
9 inches thick. The belt is 12.6 inches thick. The turrets are 14 inch thick. And the main deck is 3.9 inches thick. So, what we have, therefore, is a French battleship. Which, as you know, has a higher top speed. Two knots, so faster. They have the same amount of guns, but... If this one is pointing towards them, it will present uh, to the Bismarck, it will present a far smaller target and still be able to bring all its guns to bear. Whereas the only way that the Bismarck can bring all its guns to bear and it's all its weapons to bear is if it is able, it is broadside onto them. There is also the fact that the Riccolo has a 0.3 inch thicker belt that's nice three inches thicker on the turrets that's more helpful and main deck is 6.7 inches to the 3.9 inches of the main deck on the bismarck so yeah I, my money would actually be on the rickaloo in this one because they can present a smaller target profile and still maintain all their guns firing. And they could, by fair means or foul, take more hits. So that's the reality, is that, you know, they are the ones that have the side advantage on this one. Let's see. Uh, Trent Tanga. What's the Trent? What are the Japanese doing in late Nafa 42? Killing Allied fighters with zero escorted Type 1 bombers from Samar. Hmm. That's good. If I'm remembering, the, uh, remembering right, the Vichy French government had to quickly replace quite a few command officers to worry if they'd ignore the treaty and join the British Navy. Yep. To France, Sure, Mac. Uh, two panel was a great anti tank gun for its time. The six panel could pen a, t a tiger at close ranges, but yeah, it took a while for a gun that could complete, uh, compete for any length of time. The trouble is, things were developing very quickly. Hello, Melon 6040. Uh, Read China and refusing to buy. I think they would have bought, but they did not want to pay in silver, but only accepted silver for their wares. Mostly tea. Mm hmm. Hello, Frank Savado. Now, there's a face I've not seen for a while. I've been doing a few videos, but. The fluffy one you've probably not seen for a while. Um, Frank Spano, why does the UK drive on the wrong side of the road? Why does everyone else drive on the wrong side of the road? That's the problem. We drive on the right side of the road. The left. This uh, restaurant. Go, 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 But if they spend the silver on trains or steam engines, ships and other stuff, would have been better than pop, uh, probably spending uh, on silver on drugs, potentially. Uh, that's good. Regarding a 16 inch canister shot being aimed at a pond, it sounds like uh, uh, it sounds a lot less slightly like a slightly bigger than normal punt gun. They had to be banned because they're wiping out birds fast. It would wipe out entire populations fast. Tremak, I suppose I have fairly negative opinions on early British guns because they seem to think the two pounder could do everything. For an early cruiser tank, a long 40 mm is an excellent choice. For an infantry support tank, much less so. Um, that depends on what you want the infantry tank to do. If you want the infantry tank to do infantry support, that's fine. It's, you're probably right. You should probably be going for the mortar. If you want the infantry tank to do anti-tank work, the 40mm is a good, probably sensible. Sorry for my weird what ifs. I get, uh, just get mental diarrhea and let it all out. Don't worry, we all do. Um, as you probably notice sometimes when I'm having talks with people, because 
a joy of having the dyslexia I have is you do sometimes worry you're going to make a point, uh, you're going to forget to make a point, and you hear a break in the conversation, and you think it's a break in the conversation because the person has paused for a second or so, and you bl start talking, and then you realise that they were just pausing to take a breath, and it's annoying, but it's life. You learn to deal with it, and if you've got friends, they tend to sort of not mind, and you get better as you get you talk to people for longer. Ah, uh, Shumak, what if the British had officers uh, had the officers to do a rotation of senior commanders like the US did in the Pacific? Would Somerville be remembered as one of the best? Probably, but... Honestly, they'd have loved to have had the rotation, but the thing is, the Americans could do the rotation because they were mainly fighting in the Pacific. That was their major theatre, where they had to worry about command at all levels, where, uh, and providing all the levels, whereas the British were fighting everywhere else. Hello, you. What are you up to? Okay, come on. I'll be home. Um. <clears throat> even if you are going to fart. Well, you are. Stop trying to pretend you weren't. Although, what you've been eating, I have no idea. Uh. That's one. Carrier islands are because most planes roll easier to the right due to engine torque, and therefore most in uh, pilots would instinctively turn away from a problem in that direction. It's also hand. It's easier to do that than that. So it's easier for you to count the plane that way. Seneca, was there ever a naval equivalent of a do leaking classified stuff for a video game? Um. Not yet, but give it a few weeks. Frank Swanner, I thought um, uh, Matilda had great armour, not a gun. She had a very good gun for when she was designed. The trouble is, things accelerated quickly. Um, to read China, Silver and Opium. As I guess I would say, China was waging a commerce war on the West, was kind of winning it commercially, but then Clausewitz's uh, principle kicked in. Hmm. Hmm. Manly uh, uh, 640 to Tobias. I suspect the winner will be whoever got lucky on hits. Between these two, yes, but you see, I think the advantage here is that will be presenting a far smaller profile to that. And so, therefore, if everything else is equal, that's a far bigger target to hit, so you're more likely to hit something. Dr. Fernandez, I prefer having four turrets only over only two. I'd agree, yes. I would prefer it, but in my world, I would build something with four treble turrets, and then in the nicest way, at no point does that really have sufficient overall firepower, because I can go six versus eight if I want to, or I can turn the others, and I have 12 versus eight, in which case I have significant firepower superiority. But if I have a balance of guns, and one's a small target and one's a bigger target, and both are moving then the smaller profile is probably going to have an advantage in not getting hit as quickly. Plus, she has more scout aircraft, so she can probably find them more. That's good. Rolls Royce never made a tank. They did make a downgrade of Merlin engine for tanks called the Meteor, and they made armored cars in World War One. Transform only armored cars, as far as I know, but did make the engine for the Cromwell type tanks, Comet and Challenger, as well as Centurion. Oh yeah. And Grace, Afghanistan update. Taliban leadership are in the presidential palace. That doesn't surprise me. Um. Sure, mate. personally, still a fan of the all-round layout as opposed to the all-forward arrangement. So am I. But if you've only got eight guns. And you're in a one-on-one -on -one fight. 
this is the thing. If you're in a one-on-one -on -one fight, it's a one-on-one -on -one fight. If you're in an operational battleship and you're in a one -on more than one-on-one -on -one fight, or you're engaging enemy cruisers as well as that, you know, in the nicest way, you want the all-around armament. That's good. A10 goes brr. FRA goes brr. <laughs> quite probably. He's now licking my hand quite a lot, as I think is an apology for it. Uh, Re2 pounder. I have a strong suspicion that the Skoda 47mm uh, 47mm SKS 3 pounder as anti tank gun and the Panzerjäger's gun trace orange into the Austro Hungarian naval light antimony torpedo boat gun. Wouldn't surprise me. Scotia had made a lot of the weapons for the Navy prior to World War Two, uh, World War One. The Frank Sonnet, Dr. C, I found another interesting ship pick, USS Tucker DD-374, with sails on Wiki World, the SS Paul Hamilton, as an example of an ammunition ship after being attacked. Hmm. Hi, Jack Ray. Sonic Nero, the modern US Navy gets sent back to 1912 with all the support industry needed. What would be the reaction of a major, a major power speed? Oh my god, what in the name of all things holy has happened? That would be it. And in the nicest way, for support equipment, for nuclear carriers, all that lot? Oof, she could rumba. That's a very, very powerful US Navy. But that also means that a lot of other nations would be racing to upgrade their technology. And who knows what would happen, because if they are racing to upgrade their technology, because that would be such an overstep and overmatch. And, and the Americans would then also have to financially sustain that technology. And do they have the, and the, and the national infrastructure and taxation infrastructure to sustain it? Do they? That would be the question. But, as you said, all the industries to support it, so theoretically they could. They could always sell stuff to other people. Um, Daniel Phillips. Hello, Daniel. Uh, the Washington Treaty doesn't stop construction of battleships. Instead, a minimum service life of 10 years before replacement. If everything else is the same, how does it affect naval construction? Oh, my God. Uh, well, the US Navy probably doesn't do any better than it does do in real life. It might get a few more ships. Uh, you have a bit of a building holiday, but you have to remember the British will have had ships... Which have been, which are in service, the Iron Duke class, etc., and various others, um, which were in from 1911, 1912, 1913. So yes, you probably stopped naval construction, but you'll start it again in the 1920s. You'll have more than Nelson and Rodney being built, in which case you'll probably have a rolling British production. You'll probably have a 1920s class, a 1930s class of battleships. So, yeah, you could get some of, something like the KGVs and the M3s. You could even get a British 18-inch armed battleship. And you could certainly get something from the Americans. It would be interesting. It would also be quite expensive for some nations. They wouldn't be able to afford it that much, but others would be able to quite happily. Sweet. On paper, I always thought the two were on par with each other. Since France made them in response to Charnels and anything bigger, I'm looking forward to this. Did the fluffy researchers put the result of its research into the air? I would not call that that. The results of research. I would call it more the results of someone eating something they shouldn't, probably. What are you licking now? Oh, you're licking my watch. Okay. Um, Carl Gasser, did the Austro-Hungarian subs really carry an auxiliary sail as per the Biggins book? I think some actually did. Hmm. <laughs> Senator Kinnear, lol, breach of Geneva Convention. The use of chemical warfare is verboten. <laughs> Someone tell the fluffy research assistant that.
Um, let's see. Hmm. In reference to the Biggins, sailor of his uh, sailor of Austria book, you almost became the first destroyer strunk by flatulence. Potentially. Sean Mack. Oh god, I forgot the Bismarck deck was made out of paper for that period. Hmm, that's the thing. Uh to try to you can have a two bore in the UK, and that's an insane gun. Ooh, it is. Thomas Curran, uh, Geoffrey, sweet, my money was on the Riccoli, but it is always best to ask an expert. I'm just a hobbyist. Yeah, it, it basically, when you're dealing with a balance of things, it's probably going to be the Riccoli, but that's the thing, and that's the advantage. As I said, it's got better armor against plunging fire, it's got the same number of guns, and it can present its guns in a smaller profile. So if they're one on one, it's Rickley. Bug Guy is it, you know, How long does the US World War II go if the US doesn't have a two ocean navy prior to World War II to it beginning? Uh, add an extra two and a half years, probably. Possibly three. They need to build a lot more ships. I had an E9 who spent their years working with Sossus tell me he couldn't answer my question, but go to uh, read Hunt for Red October. Mm, that wouldn't surprise me. That was a fairly good, bo bo accurate book in Tom Clancy's uh, world. Um, Shumak, what if everyone lost their collective mind during the interwar period and decided that these cruiser carriers are a great idea and build a bunch of them? So, carriers around the 15 to 20,000, uh, 15 to 18,000 ton mark. Um, well, you certainly have a lot more carriers. That's the thing. Dr. Trifonius, um, they certainly help make convoy war fighting easy and they're more practical so you have more numerous ships, but. You know, let's be honest, if your limit is 23,000, 25,000 tons for a carrier, and you're building, let's say, ones on average of 16,000 tons, so you could build three of them for the pro uh, for the tonnage displacement of two big carriers, you get extra ships in the water, but you get a lot less aircraft. Because again, remember, as I'm always telling people, it's hangar size which limits your air group. Aircraft grow in size. If you don't have a massive hangar to begin with, you ain't going to have a decent air group by the end of the aircraft carrier's life. And in the 1920s and 30s, carriers were grow aircraft were growing fast, which is one of the reasons why they don't put a lot of cruiser carriers. Because they honestly don't know how big the hangars they're going to need to be are going to be. The Cronus. Obviously, the Belgian compromise is best. The cars on the right, trains on the left. Hmm. Dr. Furness, would you prefer Cadona or von Hotzendorf to lead your army? Why do I have to pick one of the one of those two? That would be my main question. But if I had to go for it, I. Hmm. I have a soft spot for things with fluffy hair, so probably Cadorna. This one, man, is in starting to have memories uh, of my older border colleague. She had unlimited energy. Yes. This one has unlimited energy when he wants something. Don't you? Yes, you do.
I don't know about leaking classified, but I remember having a hearing of naval personnel upon seeing Harbin classic system specs saying things like, I'd be put in prison if I told you these numbers. More than likely. But usually with the US Navy, you can find stuff out by just going and reading the technical brochures. <sighs> just run, all forward is the best layout. Fight me. Um... Balanced all round is the best layout, but it depends as long as you have enough guns. So if you're carrying, I don't know, 12, 15 inch guns and you have those in four turrets, that's probably the best. Um, Frank Sonner, if you replaced each British ship in combat in the Med with the contemporary American ship, would the USN have fared any better or worse during the same time frame? Um, honestly, they'd have lost carriers. They wouldn't have had any carrier. Uh, the, the, the carriers would not have stood up to the firepower that they, uh, that they were hit with, um, as well as the British ones did. Uh, depends on which battleships you replace which ships with in terms of the battleships cruisers again probably about the same they'd be okay uh, the, the main difference between the British and American design philosophies is seen in the aircraft carriers How much did Bismarck cl class have to uh, uh, turn to open up their rear turrets? Well, if you look at this picture, you can just about see the rear turrets. And that's at a roughly 35 degree angle. So I reckon Derp Squad is roughly right. But still, that's a far bigger profile than the, just the front of the ship. Let's see what uh, reaction, uh, that's like reaction would be, what are these mobile arms? 100,000 ton ships showing up? Uh, what was the displacement of the Dreadnought again? Um, displacement of Dreadnought was roughly 21,000 tons, I think, from memory. From memory, he says. Dreadnought, uh, yeah, deep load, 20, 21,060 tons. So yes, there would be a very interesting reaction. Here's a technical question. Do you think a steam generator is better than the steam boilers? Steam cars showed them being far better than boiler, but never used in ships. Why? Uh, it's efficiency, and it's the kind of fuel you use in a car in a car versus the fuel you'd use in a ship. Um, it makes far more sense to use steam boilers in a uh, ship than it, it does in a car. Anuk, possibly call it chemical warfare by the philosophy research assistant? Possibly. Senator, what is the most ridiculous plan for a warship in the era after 1905, excluding Tillman's and H glasses? Uh, pick any of the various super battleships that come up with by the Soviets, the Germans, or the, or the Japanese. They don't have the infrastructure, they don't have the energy, and they definitely aren't going to build them. Frank Sinatra, Doug to see, does Churchill have or do any crazy while he serves on the front line of the trenches? Yes. But if really, if you want to, uh, he, uh, really to um, go into that will be a whole separate video because that would be quite a while. This one from this, my spelling is so bad today. I've noticed I managed to misspell steam so many times. Mm. And Fab, how come Napoleon never took Gibraltar? Once the British had bedded in there after the great siege of Gibraltar, getting Gibraltar from Britain was going to be freaking tough. And honestly, he didn't realize the value of Gibraltar. He didn't think there was any value in it, so he was happy for the British to have it. He thought Gibraltar was pointless. Because Napoleon really didn't understand things about sea power. That was one of his big blind spots. Um...
Bad guy is each other. How much would affect? Uh, how much effect would lack of no Cold War affect things? There would actually probably be more wars in the uh, since World War Two, so it might have made it for a slightly more construction. Because the thing is, the Cold War, because there was such a big threat of mutually assured destruction, that tends to keep things under control, didn't it? It's like you and your brother. How do we keep things under control? We threaten you. We tell you both. You will lose toys if you argue. And that tends to keep you under control. Um, Manny 6340. Duh, so regarding Navy sent back and threatening to nuke, that would depend if the PAL codes are available. Those aren't kept with weapons or infrastructure to support them. Nope. Uh, Tobias, a GR3. A favorite ship that was never built. Mortal class. And Admiral class aircraft carriers, but... They're even more difficult to find out details about. And possibly HMS Agincourt, the Queens of Class battleship, which wasn't finished. Mainly because it would settle the debate between me and Drac. That would settle the debate if it had actually been built. Um, and look, I had two SCW helicopter pilots tell me that, uh, that when Hunt for Red October came out, they had naval investigators all over the place trying to find out who leaked the classified info. That wouldn't surprise me. That's what, uh, Frank Spider, I, Derp Squad and Frank Spider, I would say two things. One, stories of Churchill tend to get a bit overblown because people love to make money. And a book which is just normal, which is your normal account, might not sell well. But a book which includes stuff about Churchill, which makes him sound like he was bumbling or a metal hunter or bad, tend to sell better. Um, He's no more of a medal hunter than any other, and he's honestly no more bumbling than any other officer at the time. And honestly, he does quite well with his troops. And as, as far as I could see, if he was a medal and glory hunter, he'd have got a lot more of his troops killed. But he doesn't. And he does a lot of leading from the front, which a lot of senior officers didn't do. And whilst many senior officers might categorize that as a medal hunter, there's also part of me which sits there and goes, well... How many of you were actually leading from the front and leading by example? So, if you don't like someone leading as the person and they're leading from the front, you call them a medal hunter. If you like them, you call them a good leader who's leading by example. Evening, Graham Hunter. Take care, Dr. Trifonis. Danny 6040, trading the technical brochures. Uh, was a valid option in the 80s, early 90s, era of the game I was speaking of. Uh, yes, it was. Tobias GR3, not even Lexington's. I always thought they would have taken a little bit more punishment considering they were originally battle cruisers. Really not, they because it's their flight decks. It's going to get into their fuel systems and it's going to get into the bits which are producing and which are supporting their hangars. So that's the thing. They have a better air grip to begin with, but they're not going to be around that long to use it. The torch story was told by Churchill himself. It was. I was except that uh, I, I wasn't denying the story, but I would say also that a man who tells the same that story about him is probably not a glory hunter. He's also making a bit of a joke on himself. But no, I was talking about some of the accounts that you get from people about Churchill in the First World War, I look at them and I'm... Mm... How do I put this? Stop looking. All right. they, uh, they have different factors. You want to go in and get your tea, do you? Okay, I'm going to expand one of these ship pictures quickly for a couple of seconds while I take the big fluffy research assistant in to get his tea. Come on, you. Literally, I'll just put him inside and the girls will... My mum and sister will probably look out from his teeth.
And we're back. <laughs> Tony, Tobias GR3, why? Not even Lexington's. I always thought they would have taken a little bit more punishment considering they were originally Battlecruisers. A little bit more, but not much. Again, it's the, as I said before I left, it's the armor on the flight deck which matters and it's the, the getting the explosions into the hangar they could carry more aircraft but mm. right so how would the Calaros fare against the Latorios? the Americans have to stand and fight to defend the convoy it could have been interesting they would have fought hard it would have been uh, Let's put it this way, it would have been a far fairer fight than the Americans might have thought it would have been. But guys, hey, tune in. what if no trouble glass or Blackburn Blackburn? No Blackburn Blackburn would be sad. No but trouble glass the world would have missed out on one of its great things of history. Nice one. I have an important history update. Commander Evans served on the USS Alden at Battle of Java Sea. So soon we'll figure out what to do at Samar. Hmm. Abfab, any view on sea bases? Only any use when you have complete control anyway, or a viable idea? You need logistics, and sometimes you're going to have to take risks without logistics. So there you go. And Michael Hyang, uh, Michelle Hyang, I think it's Michelle. Oh, it's Michelle. Is there a good book paper on the Bruce Aircraft Company? I imagine going bankrupt during World War II with the US Navy being the number one customer must take a special type of incompetency. There is actually one about the Brewsters somewhere. Oh, let me just hunt it down its details for you. I have it up in my bedroom, I think. Um, basically, any book you have on the Brewsters will be focusing on the uh, Brewster Buffalo. And <sighs> I want it. This is the the best one I've got. And let's see, link. Copy that. So I'll add this in the bottom in the description. I've added in a, the, hopefully it'll show up in a second. Um. For some reason, they're not showing me the uh, the ISBN, but they are showing the ASIN, so I'm putting that in. That usually helps. And save. And that should be up there. You should be able to find the Hills of the Brewster book. I'll put that in the chat as well. Uh, 
Pam, 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 pam. Thank you. Right. Um, Rick Vassala, is there any landlocked country that had an ocean going navy? Not really. I think Bolivia at certain points has tried one when they haven't been landlocked. The white steam cars could go at 60 miles an hour. They also had massive torque and could use any liquid fuel. Perhaps lack of total steam for such a large ship was the big issue, as Clark said. It's also what's efficient at the scales of ship you're dealing with, and the scale size and the cost of it. Frank Swan, I believe Dr. C has now killed 34 flies this summer. A lot more than 34. <laughs> I don't like things flying around me while I am uh, while I am talking on these things. I'm also currently reined in the uh, various parts of me which like to um, meet up my blind for as long as I could. <laughs> It was not. It was not right. It was not right. I don't know. Okay. Do you think it was a mistake to not have Hallmars' sonar along with Toad sonar on the Constellation class? Yes. Because your Toad array can be lost. It's very difficult to lose your whole mounted, mounted sonar, and if you do lose your toad sonar array and you're in operations, well, you need the backup. That's good. A question of scale. A train can tr transport 100 containers. A ship can transport several thousand. A lot more. Uh, Anuk, what does the FRA have for tea? He has chicken and beef. He has far better chicken and beef than I have, I think. He gets them from, from the uh, butchers. So, a War Thunder player who happened to be a Challenger 2 commander lead technical documents to the War Thunder forums to complain about the CR2. Mm, love of your tank can make you go a long distance. And sorry, it is Francis' fault I did delete that message because remember, little cousins are watching. But, guy, it's your What's the whole flight deck armed on the British carriers or just the center of the center deck? Pretty much the whole of the deck. Uh, some bits forward and some bits aft weren't. But between, uh, uh, from s basically from port to starboard and from forward lift to aft lift and including the spaces alongside the lifts was armored. Team Luca, in what naval battle from World War I to World War II would you have wanted to be in the Admiral in charge of the battle? Because I love the battle, I would love the battle of Midway, but... I'm also going, I'm going to say the Battle of Norway, because if I was in charge of the Battle of Norway, by gun, none of those, so several things wouldn't happen. For starters, there would be no aircraft carrier going off on its own. And Norway would be differently run. So, yeah, I'll go for Norway.
Right on it. Let's see. Ships sunk in each class. Three ships sunk in each class at roughly the same time. Borodino, Cressy, Pola, Sofra, New Orleans, Teca. Every nation but the Germans. Where's the question? Um, because that's a cool starting point, but what's the question? Shemak, what if Prince of Wales and Repulse were available for Abda Command? It becomes different because if they're still available for Abda Command, you might well find that there are the various units which are forming up the Eastern Fleet are actually push, pushed through forward to Abda, or at least as quickly as they can do, so that might affect it. And you have Phillips in charge of Abda, and that's different because he has a big battleship, he has lots of space for staff officers, he can get officers from the Dutch Navy, from probably the American Navy on him on his ship in order to try and coordinate their efforts. He probably wouldn't need one from the Australian Navy, but he might well get one because because the Australians and the Royal Navy work to go soft so anyway, they probably don't need it. But they they, they would you know, because they are both Royal Navies, uh, but probably still would order it. And would command would coordinate with them. Oh, look, I saw a video recently of Bruce produced a dive bomb before they buffalo. There they did. Dove Scott, Tim me Locker, for me, if we had hindsight, it'd be Savo Island. So many obvious mistakes made. There are so many obvious mistakes made early in the war. I hope it helps, Michelle. Frank Spello and Car uh, Frank Spasato to answer on the question of Carl and Gasberg, he just is, I hope, winding everyone up. Uh, Frank Spello, uh, sorry, let's see, three incredible battles, Samar, Second Cert, Baron C. Could you um, someday go over their importance? I'd be love to, and I will do. I'm go I'm slowly working through battles, but, you know, I sort of go, right then, I've sp this is going to sound strange because this is probably where I am not building up people as quickly as other channels are, and probably it's a fault of me, but rather like my approach to history, some months I go, I've done a lot of World War II history more recently. I'm going to do some Age of Sail stuff. What Age of Sail battles happened this month? Ooh, that could be cool. That could be interesting. And add that in, because I think that's interesting for you, because I find it interesting to go and look at the variety. And sometimes I feel like going on a amphibious kick, and sometimes I feel like going on a aviation kick, and sometimes I do some Marines, and sometimes... Basically, I wander around them all, and to an extent, it's led by the patron, but also to an extent, it's led by the idea of what I fancy doing that month. Or occasionally, it's the books I've received to review, which inspire me. For example, we are going to be having a submarine month at some point, because, coming up, because I've just been sent this to review, the new Norman Freeman, British submarines in the Cold War. And it's cool! It's very cool. There'll be an actual proper review of it coming out soon, but this is the thing in here which you are all going to rather like. It's kind of fun to do while still supporting it. So, you have Valiant class. Swiftster class, and in here you have stretching all the way out, and so it's going to be very difficult for me to hold up at this angle because it's quite a heavy book. The resolution class, because it's gone off over, over there, so I'm going to have to move it over here. But you know, hey ho, and. That's not the only example of that in here. It's a really, really cool book. Having a lot of fun with it. Learning a lot of cool stuff. And yeah, I'm going to be getting into some more modern submarine stuff, probably, at some point, because it's interesting. I might do the submarines in the Falklands War. Because I also have some friends who are involved in the submarines in the Falklands War, and I can basically raid them for information. Or rather, in nice way, invite them on to record them. 
Um, right. Bad guy 8629, what if Essa sends for a round in World War II? Oh my god, that would be nasty. But also, think about which nations would probably have had them. Uh, Germany might have invested in that much money, but they wouldn't have had that many, because that would require a lot of infrastructure to build. Similar with Japan. So probably it would have been the Royal Navy and the US Navy. Which suddenly makes life very difficult for the Japanese Navy. But also, you have occasionally, if you sink a nuclear submarine, you could end up with nuclear explosions going off in the world's oceans, which could have tremendous impact for us to this day. I don't production. What's the legality of diving naval wreck sites, deep ocean otherwise? Do I need to seek legal permission from the ship's government to visit it? Um... I think, as a rule, you do need to inform the governments you're planning on doing it, so they can inform you if it how dangerous it's going to be. And you also need, uh, sometimes they request that you take pictures, etc., while you're down there, so they can monitor the grave site, especially if it is a war grave. If it's a registered war grave, it's got a lot of protections on it under international law. So you need to. Uh, so your best place is to, to find is to contact the government responsible. <laughs> Nighter interactions with ships like Prince of Wales and Repulse, I'd imagine not, but with wrecks like the ex Soviet SSB, SSB and SSBN K929 and K219, imagine the Russian government would be livid if those sites were listed without permission. Um, a lot. They would go very visited without permission. Yes, they would be, but um, Prince of Wales and Repulse, they also try and keep a watch on because they've been worried about the uh, various people scavenging and various metal piracy going on. Eric Harkon, a lot went wrong in Norway. The government and authorities for one. Oh, so many things went wrong there. <laughs> um, let's see. President. Sure, Mac. Uh, the senior commander should have said to, uh, to Glorious Captain, either you get along with subordinates like an adult, or you can recruit yourself since you can't do your job. Unfortunately, the senior officer at that point was Lord Corkinori, who couldn't get on with subordinates, or anyone, for that matter. Um, but guys, what if the US had signed the war with the Hellcat instead of the Wildcat? Oh, good God, there would have been zeros dead everywhere. Honestly, the, the, the zero can play with the Wildcat. With the Hellcat, if they've got the similar, if they once they get no, they get up the doctrine, the Hellcat has a lot more firepower and is a lot stronger, and is not so outperformanced in terms of speed and turning by the zero that it can't keep up and bash it. So that'd be a very big problem for them. Plus, it can carry do a lot more damage. I'm aware, but the question is, do I need to seek official permission in order to visit a wreck site like, site like Bearsmark? It's not so much official permission as you need to tell the government so they can basically inform you of what their rulings are. Because, again, sometimes some specific wrecks have specific rules around them. Next one up. The question was, is that a good example of bad luck, or just how those navies end up working within, within their fleets? As a rule, that's usually what happens. They, you, know, you lose ships, and sometimes you don't want to. You really they never want to lose ships, but sometimes you have no choice. That's what a lot of scenario happens. Sure, Mac. I'm missing the primer vids you did back in the day. I might get back into those. Now I've got the single. This is going to sound strange. The single slide vids working well, and people liked them. The main problem was I was pretty much, and this is going to sound terrible, it was so doing the whole video and then doing the live was pretty much doubling or trebling the time. And there's only so, much, so many hours you have in the day, and 
I've got to walk dogs and help out and be actually a functioning member of the family. So this is the thing. If the single video, a single slide videos are liked, then I can do one of those uh, quite quickly beforehand. Um, a few weeks, but uh, you know, a few days or so beforehand, and just record them in fifteen spare minutes, and have that scheduled to go up a few hours beforehand, just to give you a primer. So, <laughs> from I really don't know much too much on subs. We'll work on that. What guy is here to nine? But the six Alaskas have been more useful than North Carolinas and South Dakotas at the start of World War Two. Potentially, because they could have provided the carriers with a fast escort that would have been able to well, maybe not tangle too long with a Congo, but probably could make, I mean that any heavy cruisers or anything they came across would have had a nasty time. Carmen, sorry, I missed your response earlier as, as to if Brock's build was about. Also, I got more Osprey Brooks. Basically, we had bad uh, bad acoustics recording last week, so we, it's re we've redone episode 60 this week. It'll be out on Wednesday. Sure, Mike. Norman Freeman would have to really mess up a book for AC to think it's cool, or to not think it's cool. Um, I'm not quite as closely friends with him as I am with Simon Elliott, but he is a very good guy, and he does produce very good books, but I would also be honest. Because in the nicest way, my view is, if I'm reading, recommending books to other people, they're spending their hard-earned cash on it. If it's not worth it, I shouldn't recommend it. And they would expect that. They'd tell me if, if I wasn't honest. And I am. I think probably that a modern nuclear weapon, you'd have to design and engineer all the electronics necessary for timing and detonation. Maybe you have the EBW detonators and weapon. I don't know, because uh, perhaps they're ruined themselves too. 1912? You don't know how those work, and guess what? You have a weapon worth. Uh, uh, you have a weapons worth the testing. No replacements, and that's just uh, one problem. Hmm. Come on, Doctor C, you do just fine. Keeping history fresh and not getting bogged down in the weeds on the one subject. Hmm. I think you do well by choosing different topics, historical periods, and different classes of ships. The fact that you are very interested in the topic makes it interesting for the viewers. Eh, I'm glad of that. Frank, Dr. C, skewer book behind you, page 75, please. You want the skewer book, page 75? A skewer book? Where is that behind me? It is behind me somewhere, I'm fairly sure, but, um. But you wouldn't have said it was, it wasn't. He says, but he's hunting it round. Uh, the, 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 the skewer book is behind me somewhere because I was reading it earlier. Uh, reading it earlier. Can't spot it now. Not for the life of me for some reason. Oh well. Sorry. Can't deliver on that one. Ah, oh, there it is. You did have to pick the one at the bottom of the pile, didn't you? Right. Page 75. Two German pocket battleships had escaped in the Atlantic Oceans before the war had broken out, and soon set about the task of sinking unescorted British and Allied merchant ships. The presence of two powerful raiders loose in the Atlantic trade routes caused great concern. Early in October, several hunting groups were formed to try and track one down one of these vessels, the Admiral Graf Spade and destroyer. One such was Force K, which comprised the battlecruiser Renown, the aircraft carrier Arc Royal, the destroyers Hardy, Hasty, Herod, and Hostile. These ships rendezvoused off the Butt of Lewis in the 2nd of October, the Arc Royal having sailed from Loch Erebol and Renown from Scarpa Flow. They set course for Freetown, Sierra Leone, in West Africa. This steamy port became their main base until early March 1940, and from there they ranged far out into the South Atlantic. Their first voyage from Freetown was a 10-day patrol, which took them across the island of Fernando Nora, north of the easternmost hump of the Brazilian coast and back again, but they found no trace of the enemy. A second patrol as far south as Ascension Island between 20th of October and 6th of November proved as fruitless. Each day at dawn and dusk the squadrons went to action stations, but every tropical day followed another in succession of hopes and disappointments as they beat up and down the empty ocean. 
Apart from oiling destroyers, which had to be topped up by renown, nothing broke the monotony until the penultimate day. On the 5th of November, one of Ark Royal's patrolling aircraft was returning from another boring sortie when they sighted a lone merchant ship. On investigation, this turned out to be German blockade runner Unfels, and the destroyer, Herod, was dispatched at top speed to Kolha. This was well done, and she was boarded before she could be scuttled. So there was something to be shown for all their patience, but it was not the enemy they were looking for. During this period, wide air searches were conducted in the Central and South Atlantic. While it was mainly the fairy swordfish TSR that were used for deep searches twice a day, the skewers were fully utilised closer, and were ready to conduct dive bombing attacks on the German battleship once discovered, with the aim of damaging her before the renown finished her off. Graspe proved elusive, carrying out a raid in the in 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 into the Indian Ocean on Madagascar on the 15th and 16th of November, before doubling back into the South Atlantic once more. She was supported by a series of supply ships and replenished from one of these, Outmark, on the 26th of November. Meanwhile, in an effort to tighten the net, Vice Admiral Deal Doily Leon at Freetown reorganized his forces, sending Force K, now reinforced by the light cruiser Neptune, to assist Force H, the heavy cruiser Shropshire and Sussex. They probed south to the Cape, leaving their short endurance destroyers to guard the Mozambique Channel. But again, Mr. Quarry. Again, other German ships were swept up in the process. The Neptune intercepted the blockade runner Adolf Warman near Ascension Island on 21st of November, then followed a patrol between the Cape and latitude 38 degrees south, which found bad visibility in rough weather which ruled out all attempts to continue any kind of flying. After some days of this, the force turned northwards once more, the Watusi being caught on the 2nd of December by the Sussex. Skew is a good aircraft. Um... Come, please show us your top three books on tanks. Oof, they're a long way away, but at the moment, but there is definitely one which has now burst into their number because this is cool. This is really, really good. I was really, really happy to get this from David Fletcher's. It is a really cool book, and frankly, it has made my month in many respects. And it was first published in 2017, but I only got it recently, and it's Really cool. And it has all sorts of things in here. The various cruiser tanks that are just... You don't realise quite how many variants and quite how modern the tank forces were. Um... You know, you've got a Crusader here with a 5.5-inch gun on its top. That's just cool. <laughs> 5.5-inch gun on a tank. <laughs> yeah. oh. And the various tanks of the old gang. So if you're interested in TOGS, it's got an entire chapter on those. So, this one. And then I've got the tank men around here somewhere, and I've got uh, British armour divisions of World War II as well, which is all very, also very good, but they're all somewhere up there. Does it mention the, I believe, astute radiation leaks? No, because I, the astutes don't. No. There have been various stories about issues with the astutes, but radiation leaks isn't one of them. No, no, no Dr. Clark, no. Sinking nuclear sub will not cause an explosion. Um, I wasn't thinking about it being uh, sinking it causing an explosion, and I wasn't talking about modern nuclear submarines. I was talking about a 1940, 1930s, 1940s era nuclear submarine going down. That would have probably have issues. Just remember, ah, nuclear reactors are safe in oceans, even if breached. Steam explosions are very unlikely and not issue if they did happen. Aglef, how long till China's scrappers as Scardi's war grows of steel? Mm, I'm probably already there.
New IKB four four seven two. Where is the best place to find images of post foot nineteen hundred ships with improvised sailings? Bonus points for submarines. Probably the U.S. Naval Archives because they seem to end up doing it quite more often than anyone else. I just want to say that we are all very uh, spoiled by the size of your channel. I mean, where else can you get this quality on such a personal interactive level? I try. Thank you very much. This is awesome. I know why there are several responses. Nuclear reactors are quite safe in the sea. Uh, they are safe in the sea, but again... You're talking about modern nuclear reactors or the nuclear reactors. We're talking about, if you're saying nuclear reactors for World War II, you have to put them in the context of running a nuclear reactor with the technology available at the time. Okay? So think of a 1930s, because that's what you'd be talking about in the 1940s. 1930s technology running a nuclear reactor. And if you've got a 1930s nuclear reactor and a 1930s submarine style hull and all the, the uh, things they'd be formed for that, and then you have an explosion, they get hit by depth charge or something like that. I I don't think it might be as safe as a, as sort of some of the reactors. Considering what happened with some of the early submarines and early reactors anyway, could be an issue. Excellent. Apparently, Church's right hand man of General Lumsden was killed on the battleship New Mexico by a kamikaze, not in New Mexico. That makes more sense. So, here, the single slide thing was good, but two or three sides would be great. So, basically, you really liked the Battle Atlantic, the original, or the redo rather than the original. Dan Hedron, did you manage to keep any of them on for 15 minutes? I think I managed the Maginot Line and Cruiser Submarines. Derp, into Submarine, uh, mainly 640. Derp, into Submarine Confused? We were talking about Surface Navy going back to 1912. SSBNs are actually the one class where PAL codes are not required. Four keys are required to launch a US, US, US SSBN. All those keys are aboard. Hmm. Hieroglyph. Alaska's role will be distract Congo whilst carriers escape. Hmm. And just theory, the crew could easily bypass. Uh, and just theory, the crew could easily bypass the key switches. Hmm. Thanks, Doctor C. Do you know about the difficulties of finding wrecks, say, twenty miles offshore in two thousand feet of water? It's not easy. It's not easy at all. Uh, you have to have the right support craft for starters. And. Um, by um, that, I mean something with decent imaging sonar. Thanks, Mano. The IJN Congo is 60 miles off Taiwan in 300 feet of water. Why has it not been found yet? All right, so the thing with nukes is they explode by the fuel basically imploding. So, yeah, three kilometers of ocean on top might lead to one exploding. Unlikely, but not impossible. There's a whole book on Skia? I'm shocked. I know it's Ron's fault. But it's good. But guys, see you soon. What if MacArthur was retired stateside before World War II? You might have a slightly more cerebral functioning general in charge of the war in Southeast Asia. A slightly less bigger personality. Nimitz probably has far more power. Because in many ways, Nimitz was the more coherent general, so a uh, more coherent strategist, so was uh, as an admiral and uh, various other things, so was able to get a lot more support behind him. But MacArthur was able to outpace that with his political acumen. If you have a different general, Nimitz has more, much more power. And probably becomes supreme commander. Pacific theatre for everything and includes Southeast Asia in that. (laughs) 
Senator, a single 1940s battleship sent back in time would revolutionize tech in that era also because of scout planes and power generation. Let's be honest, the efficiency of the power generation in King George V versus a the power generation in the Dreadnought, if you send it back, uh, King a KGV, to 1904, they could probably manage most of the technology. It would be difficult, but they can manage most of the technology in that ship. If it's got scout planes, etc., if it's come from 1940 back to 1904, they could probably manage it. But that's going to have a huge impact on the Royal Navy and on the world as it develops. And it's going to come down to the actual, the, the sheer ability to generate pound per pound power. Mm-hmm. And our reduction. We often hear of attempts to ma made to pin down Grass Bay, but what was done to pin down a sister Deutschland, later renamed Lutzau? Um, honestly, Deutschland, uh, they were trying to pin her down. They had similar teams up there hunting her, but she was withdrawn before they could pin her down. McEadron, the Vatican City is a secular place that has a king. How do you see it as a religious organization headed by the Pope? Mm. Bit of both. And FYI, for those interested in Rex, there are online surveys available for HMS Hampshire, Vanguard, and Warlock. Hmm. Cool. Here's it. The Vatican City is unique in that it is the only country to have an absolute monarch where succession is not based on hereditary... Uh, there is... We, we, won't, we won't get into that. There are some other interesting monarchies in the world. Um... Dr. Clark, nuclear weapons require an incredibly precise set of conditions for explosion. Conditions that virtually cannot, even in theory, occur in a reactor, regardless if it's a theoretical 1930s reactor. I agree. They require basically a runaway out of control reaction to generate a nuclear explosion. The thing is, a 1930s reactor would probably be far more. Uh, fine manual control and fine tuning, which is why I think it could be potential. But I will, you know, I'm not going to die on this hill. It's not something I'm going to fight, uh, fight over. It's just in my mind, the 1930s reactor is going to be far more dependent upon human intervention and human monitoring those things and making very, very precise calculations to maintain it than what was achieved later with all the efforts that went into it. This round, nuclear reactors to explode need high enrichments, followed by uniform pressure. Reactor failures will kill the whole crew, but on a broader sense, non-issues. Hmm. Gasman, uh, 13. Did I miss the Blackburn Blackburn? No, it's always here. It's in, it, it just turns up in my chat. Tobias, GR3Y. Uh, GR What's in last glass, just in general, as it seems to be a ship built in the wrong period of the war? Well, let's get a picture of them for starters.
and change and get the Alaska class picture around. And up that pops. Bam ba dum ba da 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 Makes more sense, but where's my last class? There you go, there she is. That's a good fun for our Alaska class. That's our picture, our USS Alaska, pictured on the 11th of September 1944. So I have to admit, this is me quickly having turned on the Pacific War Online in, in online encyclopedia. Top speed, 33 knots. Tonnage, about 29,800 tons sand displacement. They are 246 meters, 0.43 meters by uh, 27.76 meters by 9.86 meters in draft. And... They carried nine 12 inch guns. They carried, well, 12 538 dual purpose guns. Uh, and lovely, and this is <laughs> in quadruple mounts, they carried 56 40 millimeter Beaufort AA guns. And in single mounts, they carried 34 20 millimeter Erlocon AA guns. So, yeah. Oh, and they had a 9 inch belt which was sloped to 10 degrees, so was equivalent to a 12 inch in different points and uh, tapered to 5 inches at the bottom edge. So, yeah. Pretty cool. An able of 12,000 nautical miles at 15 knots. They are pretty much large cruisers uh, slash escorts. And the thing is, if you'd had them available in 1940, 1941, the US Navy would have loved them. They would have been absolutely obscenely pleased with them. But by the time they enter service, you're dealing with the destroyer swarm, you're dealing with the light cruiser swarm, and there isn't really the surface threat to the carrier groups that you need to worry about, because again, there were the Iowas and the New Jerseys. Honestly, there isn't much which is going to get past them. So... They are about four years too late. Prior to that, they'd have been really, really useful. And I have to admit, honestly, prior to that, I can see, uh, you know, the Navy which could probably have used them most would have been the Royal Navy. If they'd had these, they'd have been really, really happy because those 12-inch guns, that means you don't have to worry about the Shan Horse. You don't have to worry about the... Dunk, uh, the Deutschland class, you don't have to worry pretty about any much anything apart from Bismarck and Tirpitz or Latorios. So the thing is, those would have been really useful for the Royal Navy in the beginning of World War II. They'd have been really useful for the US Navy in 1941-42, bit into 1943. By 44-45, they're not as useful. Um, but guys, it's human. What if no aircraft carries a Model 2? Then there's a lot of basically actions which look not too dissimilar, well, more to Dogger Bank than to Jutland, probably, around, happening around the world.
I thought, uh, Frank Spurlock, what do you think UK should do with all decommission, uh, decomm uh, decommissioned SSNs and SSBNs, probably? Um, carry on with the process of decommissioning them. It takes long enough. This sort of reactors are safe by the fact they can't nuclear explode. Steam explosions 200 meters under the sea is not an issue. Saltwater is also a great moderator. I agree with all those things, but, um, yeah. Carmen, have you watched New Animal Park on BBC? Nope. Bad guy eight eight two nine. Would Stalin have tried to take the rest of Europe if the Allies had to invade Japan? Um, probably not, because he'd have probably wanted to be involved part of the invasion of Japan. He might well have tried for the whole of China. And in nicest way, there isn't much in Europe left to fight over. There isn't anything there for him to get other than space and people. And at a certain point, he's going to run into uh, run into America, being annoyed with him. Um, Dirt Squad, I have no idea about that. Um, I hadn't even heard anything like that is happening with Wargaming. As far as I know, they are popping along lovely. I, I've been chatting with Tuki recently, he seems to be okay. And I know we've got Armchair Admirals coming up on a Monday soon. I'm not sure what we're doing this month. Sure there are ideas, but you know, I look forward to it. I like doing the stuff with, uh, with Wargaming. They're fun people to work with. Um, admittedly, I am very much, as like Anderson Drak is, a volunteer, um, uh, you know, sort of, it's a extent, volunteer when I say, um, we're not paid by them. We turn up and we're basically, we work with them. Yeah, we do it because it's fun to do. And we get fun projects. And I like wargaming in that I like the people and I like the ships. And I like spreading. I, I like doing it because, as I said before, it's a way to get more people passionate about history, is my mind. Because I don't care how you get people interested in history. I care you get people interested in history. Because I fundamentally disagree with that idea that those who study history are doomed to watch those people who don't repeat it. I think it's the job of those who study history, if they have a passion of history, to try and find a way to get as many people passionate about history as possible so that their things, those mistakes aren't repeated. Tis Francis, actually you're wrong. Never act as a field with HEU. Mm, yes, but again, a 1930s reactor would possibly be that way, but... Mm. Frank Spanner, if the Allies push Germany and Japan back to their borders and don't invade, and no treaty to end war, what do both even have to start things up again? Nothing. But honestly, the Allies wouldn't have been satisfied with that. That's the thing. You're in the nicest way. You're Greeks fighting Romans if you're the Italian, if you're the Japanese and the Americans. Japanese do not have a concept of why the Americans aren't giving in. It's oh, good lord! Blackburn, Blackburn has appeared in the chat. Um, the thing is, there are some nations on this earth who do not understand the concept of losing a war. They will fight till they win it. They don't stop fighting till they win it. And there are some nations which understand, feel that like it's negotiation. And in the nicest way, we're sitting here currently talking about probably Afghanistan is going on background. People are going, well, that proves America no longer fights to win a war. But the trouble is, Afghanistan wasn't about fighting a war for a long time. The Americans won the war. The Allies won the war in Afghanistan. It's building a state. And building a state is a very long-term activity. And in the nicest way, you should have probably been doing a phase withdrawal over Af of Afghanistan for at least 
10 years to, for the anything to have been set up and have a chance. And you need to do a lot more infrastructure in Afghanistan. But that's all getting into bilge pumps. And we go into a lot of that in bilge pumps this week. So I'm not going to get into that. But bilge pumps, which will come up once it goes in that a lot, including me ranting about railways for a good five minutes, probably. Alfie Rowe, how different do you think the KGVs would have turned out if the Admiralty ignored naval treaty restrictions? Um, either 15 or 16 inch guns. And probably. Twelve in four treble tu treble turrets, and probably add another fifteen thousand tons onto their weight, so they get the speed, armor, and range they want them to have. Many different Dutch Clark. Sure, lack of automatic controls, but also the materials required in a specific configuration is not present in the reactor, which precludes a nuclear react explosion. Okay. Tobias GR Freeway. What can I say? I have a pension for petty ships that don't get a whole lot of use. I think you mean a ponchon. Not pension, but a ponchon. Yes, quite a lot of stuff. Okay. Pete Dawson, and Alaska against the Grass Bay would not be pretty for the Grass Bay. Right, they, this shit, Alaska's actually had armor for starters. Frank Spada, what other great ships came around after they were needed? Vanguard. I'm not sure ships turn up after they're needed. They're always refighting last war. Let's be honest, we needed the Type 45s and the Queen Elizabeth class carriers in the Falklands War. <laughs> Anak, I never noticed. Is that a trans concern? Roughly. Um. Tobias GR3, great ship, wrong time. Fortso, one of my favorite to have, uh, despite the immortal question, where are Alaska's and Guam battle cruisers or large cruisers? Large cruisers. Large cruisers. Gun sizes get bigger, but and so do ships are a ship's going inflating the size. These are large heavy cruisers. They're not battle cruisers. They're a battle cruiser. They need to be fitted with battleship level guns. And by 1944, 12 inch was not a battleship gun. When you've got the ships fitted with 18 inch and 16 inch guns. 15 inch guns is a regular occurrence. 12 inches is not a battleship gun. Nothing new. Bad guy, if the Soviets had helped with the invasion of Japan, would Japan have been split like Vietnam and Korea? Quite possibly. Occasion, it's Games Workshop being Games Workshop, not World of Warships. Glad to hear that. Commander, oh, you might not answer, but why did the UK not build carriers with cats on them? Life would be so much easier these days. Honestly, for starters, we were going F-35B from the get-go. To And originally, the carriers were supposed to be kept going and operate on the carriers, so they had to be stovel. 
Secondly, for Britain, the odds are that we're going to replace, and eventually they're going to talk themselves into this, but they are pretty much heading out of that, um, Albion and Bulwark with LHDs, which will have ski ramps on. So we will have four ships which can operate the, the same, uh, any of the same aircraft types, rather than just two. So if you have a lot, if you have a large navy and can afford to have your ca enough carriers and ships uh, and carriers to guarantee availability, that means you're going to have three to four flight, uh, four, three to four flight decks. That's great. But we weren't ever going to build four carriers, and we weren't aren't going to build more than two LH, two to three LHDs. So we could end up going for five ships and three docks. So the guaranteed availability will be one dock and at least two flight decks at any one time. So that's what, uh, and those flight decks would be interchangeable in that we could operate F-35Bs and the helicopters off any of those flight decks. So for Britain, it makes more strategic sense. Let's put it this way. You get more capability, individual capability, from a catapult aircraft, a carrier. But you get more strategic availability from having more flight decks able to operate your air, your carrier aircraft. You either need to build more carriers or you need to build them as a versatile carrier. And you need to build it so it's interchangeable. Hieroglyph, that might have been how Afghanistan started out about being killing terrorists and all that stuff, but once you're in there for 20 years, it's about building a state, and they marked that one up. And fam, given the pickle of the Ala picky of the Alaska, which looks like an hour, which looks like a South Dakota act, and the Bismarck Usian confusion, uh, would design similarities personal for deception or just design style? Design style. Mostly for it. Nuclear reactors and weapons are something I've done quite a lot of research into, and I don't tell someone they're wrong, especially Dr. Clark, lightly. Hmm. I have to say, I don't mind. Uh, you see, I am not a nuclear specialist and don't claim to be. I, I, I have to say, it's just my view of 19... As I said, it's my interpretation of what I think 1930s tech reactor would be probably made of and would be like. And I have less faith in the engineering and qualities of it than necessarily Melanie does. And Melanie is probably right. She probably understands reactors far better than me and is more than likely right about them not going off. My thinking is that it's not so much the crush depth I'm worried about, it's where the explosion takes place. <laughs> I'm thinking if it happens in the shallow waters in the Mediterranean near the surface, that could be a very interesting occurrence. Cadron, only a five minute run to our railways? Well, I had to give way because Jamie was going to do about another five minutes as well. Uh, but guy, how much longer would the Philippines have lasted if the US didn't lose its army air force on the ground? Well, they might have done a couple more weeks. Paragraph, not much longer. B-17s were overrated as midway shows. They could have still inflicted quite a lot of damage on the various areas the... Um, Japanese were using for logistics.
Knight, uh, Knight 9247. Could the Royal Navy beat the US Navy in 1946? <sighs> We're just talking a straight up match between the navies. The US probably has more aircraft carriers, but they're all in the Pacific. If you're talking about a straight up match, just line up all the fleets together. And, and you know, equality of support and everything. It's an interesting matchup, let's say. Um, both sides have quirks, the US have an edge in terms of carrier numbers, the Brits probably have an edge. Certainly have an edge in certain other vessels. 1946, they have roughly the same tonnage in most things, apart from it evens out between the two fleets. But if you're fighting... This is going to sound strange. If you end up fighting a global war as it stands... British tank, Mediterranean, Indian Ocean, Atlantic, fairly quickly. American forces in those regions are minimal. Pacific, British Pacific Fleet will need to withdraw quickly to probably Singapore area. Americans would need to would focus, and then it would come down to a fight of what a, would the American Pacific Fleet want to come back to the Atlantic to protect the Atlantic side? If they do that, that leaves the British Pacific Fleet able to free range. So it becomes a strategic conundrum. But at a certain point, the Americans have quite a lot of industrial capacity, building capacity going in, and that's going to wear. The British are building more ships, but... Yeah. Yeah. Odds are on the American industrial might in the end. But it would be a very, very better run for its money. Guardsman 13. How differently do you think the war could have gone if Meza Kabir ended with the whole fleet sailing to join uh, the Free French? Well, as I was saying earlier, if the whole fleet had sailed to join the Free French, you'd probably have things like Hood would have gone in for a her refit. Because you'd have had more battleships, so and fast battleships, so you wouldn't have needed to keep Hood out. Um, it's mass. It, that's what it would have been useful for, the mass of things. Logistically, it would have been complicated, but they'd have managed it. Myra, from how during the Washington Treaty, lots of ships were built for rapid conversion. It was a ramp to war? About those cats. <laughs> hmm. Tobias Geo Freeway. Was it possible to add the, through whatever means, to come out on top in Java Sea? If so, how? If they'd managed to close very quickly. At either dawn or dusk, when the light was worse for Japanese rangefinders and the Japanese didn't realize they were there, they might have been able to achieve something. And another one bites the dust. Um, but not really. They were facing fairly comprehensive superiority of force. 
So better to probably... It, 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 again, if they'd had something like um, Prince of Wales and Repulse there, they might have done better. Oh, good lord, I've caught up with the chat. Outmorph. Out. Thank you. That was annoying. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see. How many, Bug Guy 8029, how many constellations do you think the US Neon needs? Um, I'd say build 60. Build 60, and then take a, uh, then to ask yourself if you need any more. But basically repeat the OHPs. Build enough. Graham Hunter, how knackered was the hood? Did they get caught with their drawers down again and in true British fashion just get on with it in prey? Um, she wasn't that knackered, but she did need a refit. She was due to have a, a lot of work in done. But really, it was a very, very unlucky shot. Come guys, Re-30's fictional reactor issues. My issue is not making them explode as Hiroshima, but blow up as a dirty bomb, a.k.a. Chernobyl, contaminating a lot of water. That's more what I'm thinking of when I'm thinking of the explosions. Come to C4. On the subject of Greeks versus Romans, I'm willing to accept the feat. What are your thoughts on Professor Lambert's theory of sea power, continental power split in sea power states? He's my old prof, as you know, my old supervisor from my PhD, and yeah, he's, I broadly speaking, agree with him. There are some nuance, but we're academics. There's always nuance. Knight 9247, is the Chinese Navy an actual threat to the UK? Okay. <laughs> So, are you talking as a threat to the UK or the threat to the UK interest? Because that can be a factor. The Chinese Navy are, depending on their government and depending on the choices they made and the scenario that unfolds, could well be a threat to the world system. As we currently stand on it. And the world system as it stands is very much in the interest of Britain. It might not be in the interest of all nations, but it's in the interest of Britain and maintenance of that world order. So therefore, doing what we can to uphold it and support it makes a lot of sense for us because it protects us. Okay? So, are they an actual threat to the UK at the moment? Probably not. I don't see a Chinese amphibious task force and carrier battle group sailing back around to the Atlantic and invading the UK. Do I see it as a potential threat to the Pictan Islands? Possibly in fullness of time. Do I see it as a potential threat to nations we are allied by ties of blood, heritage, and history with? Yes. Do I see it by nations we are bound by various treaties to protect as a potential threat to them? Yes. So therefore, are we likely to have to, uh, have to be involved? Probably. And if we are involved in the Far East, it's going to be Navy. So, as Dirt Squad put it, to anything on the UK islands? No, they currently don't have the global reach, but they're working on it. Do UK interest in islands on Asia? Definitely. So, here, pre dreadnought starships are exempt in naval treaties, so totally allowed to build and have. What would the signing powers do? Uh, 
let's put it this way. Uh, a, a lot of heavy cruisers would, well, let's put it this way. The heavy cruiser role would be heavily dominated by pre-dreadnoughts. That's good. Moths only speak Milanese, really? So, Nathan, building 60 and then asking yourself if you need any more is a good way to approach any warship construction in general. Yes. Bud Guy 8829, do you think Russia would side with China in a future war between Pacific Allied Nations and China? I think Russia and China are another de facto alliance, and I think it'd be interesting to see what they do. Anuk, do you agree with Drax's theory on location of Edershot to Hood? He has presented a very compelling and well thought out and thoroughly investigated case, and yeah, pretty much I do agree with it. Nine, nine two four seven. Do you think the Axis would have won if Russia remained an Axis power till the end of the war? No, but I think there would have been another country which got nuked at the end of the war. I think they'd have probably had to take out Japan, and then they'd have turned and had to take out Russia. The Santa fault. I agree on both. Right, on both. Uh, both counts. Sean Brennan. General understanding is that if after killing Gull, Japan decided on southern strategy to get required resources, how would northern strategy in a superior, superior get access to resources? Uh, basically, the idea was that there are lots of resources in Siberia. So if we take it off to Germ if we take it off the Russians, we can have all the resources, and the not, neither the Brits or the Americans will complain because we don't actually war want war with the Brits and Americans if we can avoid it because they are far too powerful. And they would have a lot of oil, etc., and various other things from uh, from Siberia. Sorry, Russia was never an Axis power to start with. Mm, they kind of divided up Poland with Germany, so let's be honest, they're not really an Axis power, no, but they are not exactly a... Um, Mm. Thanks, Simon. Um, could you see my earlier question on Congo? I wasn't really sure what the question was, so that's why I didn't answer it. My uh, uh, to try and keep up with the chat, I do have a policy of if I'm not sure of what the question is, I just skip along. The Soviet Union never had a uh, non-aggression um, pact with Germany. They never, well, they weren't ever an Axis power, to my knowledge. I'm wrong. You're not wrong, but as I said, they did divide up Poland, so there's a, they're one step away from being an Axis power, but definitely not one step towards the good guys. Greetings, Animal 16365. So, let's see. How am I doing? Oh, good lord. We, we are consistently sort of keeping in the 50s of viewers. Thank you. And super chats have gone into the profit margin. That's nice. Sorry, when I say that, I mean the um, the lovely. <laughs> okay, so when you're looking at the stats and the various things that YouTube produces, one of the things they do is they produce a thing of. Uh, in the last 28 days, are you up or down in terms of the number of people subscribing to the channel? I'm down. 
I'm usually at a roughly 130, and only 108 have joined in the last 28 days. So I'm down on 22 subscribers on my normal progression rate. Um, don't know why. Probably not because I because I haven't been doing lives because I've been away. So that's probably where it was reduced it. I don't know. But also, they produce it on your various earning factors. So I've been producing a lot more recorded videos. So my earnings from adverts are slightly higher. But my earnings from super chats have gone whoosh, because of course there's been no super chats because there's been no lives, which is what I find funny about them because they don't do it. They're just doing it over 28 days. They're not doing it over how many lives you've done in the last period or etc. or nothing like that. So now there's a super chat registering and it's just registering and sort of going, you are here. You are still negative. And you're going, Joys of YouTube. Michael, uh, Michelle Hines, uh, with all the constraints and concerns the British had with building enough of the, uh, enough of and right type of cruises in the interwar years, hindsight, did they do as well as they could have? What would you change? If I could change anything, I would have started a crash building program of our refusers, as well as Dido's and town uh, town classes in about 1937, 1936. Uh, actually, honestly, in 1937, I would have been crash building carri uh, carriers and light cruisers because what I need, what I, that's what I know, uh, that's what I know I need. And our refusers and town class would be the two groups I'd want. I'd also lengthen the hull and beam of and broaden the beam slightly on the didos. Just enough to make them work. Okay, hold on. We need to start building in or Copenhagen strategy will start stealing in true our own fashion. Well, the Chinese are certainly building a lot of ships. Perhaps we could borrow some of those. I mean, acquire. Skip here for Hello. What would have been the repercussions worldwide and with British Dominion policy if the Anglo Japanese alliance was renewed post World War One? It was renewed post World War One. It was dropped due to um, the Noble Treaty, etc. Wrong one. Wrong one. Back in a second. Doggies appeared at the window. Doggy bought me another bar pack of berries. <sighs> Let's see. 
Mm. To borrow a modern US term, USSR was part of Axis Evil for the part they played in Poland. Yep. That was great. And GR White. Always a pleasure, uh, Dr. Fan. It's, uh, it's fun to discuss. It is. And I'll be going till about, ooh, at least 10 o'clock. My message is profit margin. Yes. Basically, they try and work out what your hourly time is worth and whether you're actually earning enough to justify you doing it. And you go, I do it because I enjoy it. Hello, Bear Smith. Greetings to Canada. Bad guy eight eight two nine. Do you think the eyes can contain China in the future war? Well, that's the billion dollar question, isn't it? And the billion pound one. That's what we're all thinking about. Can we? Very exciting. The Molotov Rich Rivenkrop Pact was buying time and buffer space for both sides, and they knew it. The Nazis and the USSR were ideologically opposed to each other by definition. Yeah. Sometimes, the what on paper should be the best of enemies are the best of friends in real life. Thanks, Wanda. If you know, I wanted to get a campaign together to have Liskin Bay found, how expensive do you think it would be? It should be off Markin, it's three miles deep. Well, you're going to need a lot of special equipment to go down there. I see As to down on subscribers, how long have you been uh, not doing uh, live stuff away? I was away for roughly three weeks. So, roughly three weeks of no lives. It makes a difference. It does. I'm not 16365. What was the Royal Navy's view on inclined armor? I know they used it on Nelson class and Hood, but not on the KGB or Vanguard. It depended on what they were designing the ship around and what the whole ship was going to be. If what they, It depended on their idea of what the operational requirements of that ship was going to be. So if they thought it was going to be sitting there pounding away with other battleships in the battle line, they rather liked inclined armour. Or if they thought that was the sort of battles it might end up into. But if they thought it was going to be more of a running engagement, then they thought they'd prefer to use other systems. <laughs> What would have been the repercussions worldwide of the British Dominion's policy? Anglo Japanese alliance was renewed post World War I. I think I answered that one already earlier. I guess somewhere in the end of the pandemic is why fewer subscribers. That too. Uh, were Montana's ever a viable idea? And would they have been viable post World War II? They were a viable idea. Would have been fun. Viable post World War II. Yes, but they wouldn't have been the centerpiece of fleets as they were originally been designed to be. That was going. That was going to be the carriers. No, uh, moment 1943 passed. Night 9247. What do you think happened to the French summary Minerva in 1961? Honestly, I don't have much of a knowledge on it to be able to guess on that one. Um, I'll study it more if you want and go away and have a look into it, but that'll be a little sort of five minute video at some point of me going, This is an answer to Night 9247, uh, 9247's question. If you send it through to me on Discord, that helps. I'm more likely to remember it then, which sounds terrible, but dyslexia here. I know what I can remember, and the chat doesn't always rem doesn't remind me, whereas Discord tends to flash at me when I haven't responded to things for a while. Uh, Sean Brennan, we... Uh, let's... Uh, no, I don't think it's... Um, Bud guy eight eight two nine. If or when there's a war with China, do you think someone will take out the Three Gorges Dam? Oh, that would be a disaster and a half, but they might. Shimbran, 
We know now that Western Siberia has oil and gas reserves. What was this known in the 1940s? And could they have exploited 1940s text? Yes, and um, yes. Plus it has other minerals and iron ores and ores, etc. up there. Hieroglyph. Even in the 1940s, everyone knew the USSR had lots of oil. Some was already being exploited, mostly in the Caucasus. Graham Hanna, containing China. Like you and Jamie said, we need friends and need to start being smart about that and fast. Yes. MC4, do you think the RM would have been better off with a mix of tribals, JMM classes with four and a half inch uh, dual purpose for AA and Leander's I refuse surface action than Diodai's trying to do both? If they could have got them in sufficient numbers, yes. But Diodai's aren't a bad idea. If they had been built slightly bigger beam and slightly longer, they'd have been a far more successful class. On the contrary, it doesn't really take any specialized equipment to go down a few miles on the ocean. Specialized equipment is only required to come back up from such a depth. Very cute, very smart, and very true. But still, if you want to, if you want to do a successful expedition down three miles, you're going to need a lot of specialized equipment. Kang of Sweden, really ideological opposition. The British and maybe even the US were on the Soviet soil just 20 years ago. And yeah, during the intervention before Barbarossa. And Franco Spain was accepted by NATO. Yeah, but Franco Spain. was always more Catholic than fascist -y. They were fascist -y. I'm not going to say they weren't, but they were more Catholic than fascist -y. And there was the fact that they actually hadn't joined the fascists in fighting us in World War Two. It did help them. Animal sixty three six five. Thanks for answering my question. Thank you, and thank you for the super chat. Um, I would say do not believe that Chinese products are necessarily terrible. They aren't. And as a rule, leave your enemy uh, a plan for your enemy being just as advanced and capable as you are. Because the odds are they're more capable in some areas, less capable in other areas, and it'll even out in the mix. And if you plan for your enemy being inferior to you and they aren't, you are mucked up. If you plan for your enemy to being equal to you, you at least have a fighting chance if they turn out to be superior to you in anything. Bad guy eight eight two nine. What do you think China would do if Free Gorges Dam collapsed on its own? Have a panic attack. That would not look good. That would not look good at all. Thanks, one. Do you and other naval historians ever get have get to get to have get together? It's pretty common. We have conferences every all the time. When we do have conferences, it's quite funny. Um, watch out for things like the new researchers conference for the British Commission for Military History and the British Commission for Maritime History. Both are pretty darn cool. Uh, there's a few others at King's College London and other things which are fun. I tend to put in papers and go and talk at the conferences. Um, I haven't done a conference in the States yet, but that's mainly because of money. To do a conference in America is expensive. It's really expensive to get to a conference in America, but it would be fun. And there's, 
Also, some conference in Australia I'd always love to go to, but no, I, I, that's a lot, a lot of money. Ah, yeah, I was um, a PhD student. I'm a junior lecturer, contract lecturer. Yeah, there are some things which are out my price range. Depends. Senior engineer, what was the crackiest uh, of crackpot schemes that worked in naval context? Fire ships at the Armada. By any stretch of the imagination, that and the force, the Armada was strong enough, big enough, they should have had small boats out that would have steered up to the fire ships and steered them away. But they didn't. They didn't have anything done. Any competent naval commander should have been able to protect against fire ships. They didn't. It shouldn't have worked, but it did. That's good. Depends on how quickly Western powers would give up on the Geneva Conventions. Dams are considered civilian targets like hospitals and are not meant to be attacked. Not meant to be attacked, no, but accidents happen. Unicorn, no, I didn't. My dog did. The fluffy research assistant. But again, how much land sea grab do you see China wanting or are able to do? Well, it depends on the scope of their ambition and how much they think they have to reinforce what they're going to get. Do they think they can take it and no one will come back to try and get it? Or do they think whatever they take, they're going to have to heavily defend? And so that's good. What, Japan didn't have a plan to win the rest of the war because they didn't think there was going to be a rest of the war. They thought they'd win the battle and then the war be over. And look, at those squad, that's why there is a damn bus of squadron in the RAF. Yeah, and it's the one being the, that's deployed on the carriers at the moment on Queen Elizabeth going in the South China Sea. With a Royal Navy squadron commander, but yeah, still. The damn busters are in the South China Sea. Oh, sorry. oh, yeah, Dr. Clark, I only learned yesterday that I chased studying naval architecture. Really? Frank, sorry, did you ever know Christopher Hitchens? Mm, not personally. If the USS Pennsylvania, bug guy, did you know, was preserved in a museum ship, do you see her in Pennsylvania, or Philadelphia, or Pearl Harbor, with a fallen sister? <sighs> Probably Philadelphia. But... At Pearl Harbor would be cool. And again, you could start a GoFundMe for your conference. You see, in the nicest way, there are, there are some serious things where I see people starting GoFundMe's for, and I support them. I think me attending a conference is something I want to do for my personal professional development. I should pay for that myself, and that's what I try and do. I, I do try and work. I, I do a lot of work. Uh, that what happens. Uh, that that's you know that's what I you know do the work for, and it's, it's going to sound strange, but if I went to a conference, I want to pay for it myself. I always have paid for it myself. And I do tend to treat myself. It's like I save up the money and I make sure in the conference, I, for starless, I make sure I'm in a decent hotel room. 
or an Airbnb or something which is a decent equivalent place that I can be in that is nice and safe and I can take my stuff to. I try and get there at least a day beforehand so I have a day to get to know the area and I don't leave till the day after. And so I enjoy the conference. I go make sure I go to the conference dinner because I know the world should be based on what we do and what we set out, what we've done and accomplished. But in the nicest way, the no networking you get at a conference dinner is worth the cost. <clears throat> Make sure I've tucked my laptop firmly back in my uh, place uh, before the conference dinner. I remember once there was a conference in in Cambridge, and um, yeah, and I ended up spending most of the night off one of the nights because it was a free, two or three day conference. One of the nights, I think it was after the dinner. I spent. I had an idea for a paper, which turned into various things, which eventually turned into. A whole series of articles on um, global naval history, uh, global naval history, which you can go find on there. Uh, global maritime history, yeah. And um, basically, I spent the night wandering around Cambridge, and Cambridge is an absolutely beautiful city to wander around at night. I mean, it is lovely. Also, the amount of places you can get into in Cambridge at 1am in the morning is quite disturbing. And I'm talking about walking through the colleges. Dope Squad, when you say that accidents happen, do you mean accidents or accident or accidents? Accidents. Tobias GR free way. Imagine. Do you have a plan to win war other than attack Pearl Harbor? Japan. Yamoto. Right, here we go. Yeah. I honestly don't know if there's ever been a USS Pearl Harbor. But I will Google it. There is one. I will show you USS Pearl Harbor. She's a Harper's Ferry class landing dock ship. She was built in 1990, well, laid down in 1995, commissioned in 1998. As you can see, she has two 25mm Mark 38 cannons, two phalanx closing weapon sensor mounts, two rolling airframe missile launchers. And 6.5 caliber M2HB machine guns. Um, can carry a marine detachment of up to 504. Hmm. Um, right, um, 
Animal 1635, do you believe hypersonic missiles and super cavitating torpedoes as dead end products due to issues with the technology? Not really, but I have a feeling they're not going to come in as sort of service as quickly as people keep thinking. I think it's going to take a little longer to iron out the problems. And then they hope. As Dirt Squad said, hypersonic missiles are already in service in small, limited numbers. I think mass producing them and getting the economies of scale is going to take a little bit of what longer. But I think there are already a few in service, so you know, they're going to have an impact. To buy GF3, I'll give it when you visit when I visit UK. I'll give Cambridge a wonder. Turning 3434. Hmm. Track became a patron of Mighty Jingles. Shouldn't it be the other way around? Hmm. I think Drax also a patron of me. I, oh, that reminds me. I've got all the slides ready to load up. I've got to actually load them up. At some point, I'm going to have to probably either get a PhD student who needs some interning time or hire someone to um, help me with the admin side of this because I keep getting distracted <laughs> and don't do the things I'm supposed to do. I do have questions and I do remember all those things and putting all that up, but, but remembering to put the slides up, I've got them all sorted up and got neatly organized again. Got to load those up. We'll load them up. We'll load them up. And I get distracted by something. Mm. Hmm. Animal 16365, that's cool. That's what I've covered. I wonder how much they overcome the issues with turning or maneuvering said missile. Unless they're so fast, no target can move out of the way. Well, that's what you've. You, you, it, it depends on the range. If you're launching a hypersonic missile from hundreds of miles away, you are very much predicting on where the enemy ship's going to be. And yes, you might have a flight time of two, three, uh, of three or four minutes, hundreds of miles away. From thousands of miles away, you might have a flight time of ten or so minutes. And again, it's a prediction because ships can change to be in a slightly different position after ten minutes. As Manny sixteen forty puts out, super cavitating, cavitating torpedoes have been around since about the seventies. They haven't yet become all conquering. They're still there, though. Bud guy eight two nine. Do you think the US should have kept the Sprints class longer? It's only so long you can keep the hot, uh, keep the holes going. That's the problem. Tony three four three. I remember the time you uploaded slides on Twitter. What a time that was! That was fun. <laughs> Darius Rousey. Yes, student interns on the way to go. Keep up the spirit of colonialism alive. No, it's how do I put it? Um, some of the students. Some of the PhD students earn money by having to do research assist, uh, have to, as part of their research time, have to assist the senior academics. And honestly, I find some of the jobs which are given to them, and I'm not going to name uh, absolutely absurd. So if I designated one as my assistant and their sole job so they could concentrate on their work was upload the slides to Patreon once a week, and then you'll get your credits. That would seem quite a nice exchange. But I'm not sure I could actually do that because I'm not sure I'm senior enough to get that. But that would seem far nicer than. 
And this is not at any of the universities I've worked at, but I do know a couple of universities where they've ended up having to go and collect dry cleaning and things like that, and that seems... Mm, no. Sorry, no. Um, but yeah. Don't know if you're I don't like a use Twitter, so I highly appreciated when you got this set up and worked out. Yep, and it's worked. Well, that's what I thought. I was uh, definitely, sent. definitely students, especially if they get academic credit. That does seem sort of, if I can give them some form of academic credit for it, and it's, again, they get the credit as if they're assisting me like they're assisting any other lecturer, then that would seem helped. I don't like the using of students interns as indentured servants. That just seems wrong. Um, yeah, I've had arguments with other academics of that in the past. Again, I wonder why I don't get a permanent post in university. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's see. I was a conservative borough councillor. I argue about their treatment of, of staff and say they should uh, students and say they should treat them better. I don't keep my opinions to myself. <laughs> I generally am the same with everyone and don't have favourites. And, uh, yeah. And have a habit of calling a spade a spade. <sighs> All these are various bad character traits for an academic. Very bad character traits for an academic. I was asking, why are we still using torpedo tubes or stuff instead of using capsules outside the hull that could store torps and missiles? Like on Rosh Hashanah and stuff, they could get rid of many weak spots in the hull. Um, principally because, and I, I say this in the nicest way, you need to be able, you want to be able to reuse them, and you want to be able to carry more. And plus, the more things you have on the outside of the hull, the more bumps, etc., you have on the outside of the hull, the more noise you create. Um, and actually, the more weak spots you create as well. So you want to have it as sort of internalized as possible. Thanks, man. Debsy, could I send a super chat to have you make a video instead of Patreon? Um, I don't really know, I think I've ever set that up, but uh, I, I will have a chat with Drac about how he runs that. Uh, Don Giovanni, you guys on Bill Trumps keep mentioning that such and such hull design is decades old, even the ship itself is much younger. What are the answers in hull architecture, uh, uh, hull architecture need a redesign? It's the layout and the powering and the way you set up the hull internally. Um, let's put it this way. The architecture in the Zumwalt is a quantum leap over the architecture internally to the Burke. A quantum leap. And what's going to be interesting is when the Americans get the architecture from inside the constellation. Because that's a little bit newer in many ways than the Zumwalt hull, which was circled on a bit longer ago. And they're going to sort of... This is, this is the effect of it. Because the architecture, the internal architecture is how you design and space things out. How you structure the ship, how you structure the power positions, how you put it and function in the power supplies. This all has a big difference because of what you need to get out of the ship. The more and more things have become focused on power generation as your governing factor of how you can use your ship, the more and more we have to put effort into structuring not only the power, the sites for power generation, but the way the power flows around the ship. And that's the big problem. That's the big problem of upgrading some ships and uh, upgrading them beyond their whole life is because, well, you're basically going to have to rip everything up and restart a new to be able to lay in enough power lines.
That's what I was saying. As a former student, I approve giving them a job. So it's funny, huh? Not advocating to be a, 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 a sod to them. I hate such professors. Have them help and maybe help in a lecture. Yeah, I do that as well occasionally. They can help me out with lectures. Mostly they find that I'm slightly random with lectures because... I walk in, I have my slides set up, have your lectern and everything at the front, and um, I have this. Mouse. It was given to my gr me by my granddad as a Christmas present. The Christmas before he died. It's runny thing. A run thing is wheel is completely misshapen and all flat on all sorts of things. But what it does do is it seems to have a darn long range when I use it as a clicker. And so I still use it in lectures as a clicker, and I use it as my mouse, main mouse, and because it reminds me of my granddad, even though it probably needs a lot of fixing because it's old and it's sort of falling apart to an extent, but not that badly. Not enough that I haven't been able to maintain it. And I walk around the room. I don't stand at the lectern. I walk and I talk. And the reason I do that is that if you have enough students in the room, if you're standing at the bottom walking, talking from behind a point, they honestly believe you can't see them. But also, there's honestly no way to personally connect with them in the room. Whereas if you walk around and talk to them, and make sure you're at the front when you're doing the big emphasis points, but you can wander around a bit when you're not, when you're sort of talking through the general stuff, it allows them to focus better in on you. And I always also make sure I have notes and various other things to take so they can actually listen to the lecture instead of focusing on writing down everything I say and everything that's on the board. They're going to get the PowerPoints, they have notes, and they write down the key points of what I say. Um, I encourage them to do that. But I encourage them to listen and interact as much as possible. Because that's the style of lecture I am. Uh, bad guy is hitting it. And look, the sprints is, um, shared a lot with the Ticos. And have read that some of them had uh, a number of years left in their hulls. Mm, yes and no. Also, torps of missiles like maintenance. Impossible in a BLS or capsule. That is true. Man, I might want to mention how much of the super chats that YouTube confiscates. They don't seem to take anything from the, U uh, the super chats. I have to admit, I do sometimes have an interesting. Re Basically, the scale of money you get from your ad revenue is linked directly to your subscribers. So, and I've been talking about this for various things. So basically, the more subscribe, instead of it going in a sort of linear thing like that, it goes like that. So the more subscribers you have, the far more great, the much greater ad revenue you get. Much, much greater. And the better the logarithm works for you. It, there's a really big, cutoff point at about 10,000 subscribers. At about 10,000 subscribers, things start going up with the logarithms and various things dramatically. Um, so I'm well below that at the moment, but... Veteran. Have you ever thought about getting one of your universities involved in your online activities? I think would think a university would benefit from popular online channels. Uh, no, most universities want to keep far away from online stuff at the moment. 
they worry about what questions to be asked and what I could say. So that's why I was put a full disclaimer. No universities are involved in the production of these, and my views do not necessarily reflect the views of the university, apart from if they accord with what the university wants to project. And look, it doesn't have a mouse ball. It can't be that old. No, it's a it's old style, but not quite that old. How about guy eight six two nine? How much impact do you see hypersonic missiles playing in the in the future? Well, let's put it this way: supersonic missiles have had an impact. They've sped war up and made it greater distances. Hypersonic missiles will have the same thing. They will speed it up, and they will have an. They will. Change the distances. And you'll have to adapt. The thing is, the big problem for West, uh, the West isn't the arrival of the hypersonic missile. The big problem for the West is that for, since about 1994, 1995, they've believed that they were never going to have to fight another peer threat at sea, and the ships and the everything the uh, task forces have designed looked like it. They looked like they didn't think they were ever going to have to fight someone else. And that's a big problem, because that structures you very differently. As we talked about in Bilgefronts quite a lot, you would expect third rates to be about the modern dominant BLS size. So about 72, um, so between 72 and 80 VLS tubes we are expecting on most escorts. They aren't. Why? Because no one's actually thought they're going to have to fight a peer threat. No one thought they'd end up fighting more than one or two engagements. That's problematic. Senator, what if Admiral Ching Lee, instead of doing that dying from heart attack, gets teleported to the 2021 Olympics and has to compete in a shooting discipline? I said it probably well compared to it, considering his uh, previous performance. What guy is in? Should the USN build a large number of SSGNs like the Russians? We've actually been talking about this in Belgium quite a bit. I, I think it was the ep last episode actually we talked about SSGNs. And my, I said, basically, the idea was that if you're going to build SSGNs on any hull, you should probably take the SSBN hull you're building and just turn that into an SSGN. The fall of the USR made the West complacent. It also turned them in on themselves, re internal politics. It's transport. Yep. To an extent, it did. It really did. Good lord. How long have I been running for? Let's see. Mm hmm. Four hours and 21 minutes. Cool. And, um, I'll say any questions, because I'd probably get this to about four and a half hours, and then I'll probably decide to, well, I've got this much iron brew left. So, anything there, are VLS tubes the Monday cannons? They are. There might be a single shot, but they are. And I only said a single shot because, honestly, whilst we probably do have the technology to enable reloading at sea, 
no one's really functioning into their shit design at the moment. And that's another example of them not really designing for actually fighting a peer on peer conflict. Thanks for it. Why are SBNs not cattle ships? They are. They're a bit of a weird one because they are not used in the fleet line. Their entire role is for nation versus nation conflict with ballistic missiles, not for fighting a naval war. So, but they are capital ships because they are ships which exist to. Thank you. They are ships which exist to exert influence over events on a strategic level. Dev Squad, uh, e.g., torpedo is 5,000 yards when the wire is cut with an active distance of 15,000 yards. If it continues to 15,000 yards on the same course before I activate its mission, it's less likely to acquire. Hmm. Bud Guy 89, remember you not liking the plug that they're adding to the Virginias? No. Frederick Vega, hello, Doctor. I've been trying to catch up all day on your, con on your content here or. Here and there. Keep it up. I'm trying my best. Also, the US is recreating the fall of Saigon, literally. No, because the fall of Saigon took was about two years after the Americans withdrew from Vietnam. Don Giovanni, didn't the US design a reloading crane that fit in two or three VLS cells? Yes, they did. Ask me if they still fit them to their ships. No. Nope. As I said, it's not beyond the wit, it's just not fitted. Uh, Hang on, I'm getting messages on the Bill Trump channel. Let me just check. Oh, good lord, it was actually the same aircraft which was used to evacuate from the U.S. Embassy in Kabul today that was also involved uh, aboard a USS Hancock during Operation Frequent Wind, which was the evacuation of Saigon. Yowza. I think I am challenging uh, his dry dock length. I, I, well, it's more a friendly rivalry with the Drax dry dock length, but yeah. I mean, four and a half hours, I think, today. Um, don't you mind? Didn't the US design. Uh, design um, Dr. what do you think of the Allied naval air design strategy would be like if Claire Chennault's reports from China were taken seriously? Well, I think the money to fit Sea Scepter, etc., on the Queen Elizabeth would have been found, and I also think they might be a little bit bigger. Um, 20 to 30 meters longer. Mm -hmm. Scott, could a BLS be designed in such a way that a whole box of cells could be replaced as a unit when replenishing in a way? In theory, but that's a lot of money you're risking in one go. You drop or damage that VLS, you've lost eight, eight missiles. And all that cost. And that would be very, very expensive. But guys, seems like a lot of history is repeating itself. Yep. So, what will the ironclad and turret of the VLS era be? Hmm. Probably it's going to be... I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's the Gauss gun. 
not the railgun. Gauss gun is actually far is far technologically far easier, but far less accurate. I think the Gauss gun might be the uh, silver bullet that tries to make things cheaper. Bud guy eighty two nine. Do you see the UK getting any more museum ships? I always hope they will. I always hope. I would love a Type twenty three to be preserved as a museum ship. I think a Type twenty three should be a museum preserved as a museum ship. And honestly, I think we need to start probably a campaign to do so now. Scott, you and Drac comparing lengths. We have a friendly competition to see who's done the longest live, okay, each month. Just randomly going, how long was yours? How long was mine? Yeah. He sometimes goes for the full five, six hour route, and I usually end up about the four and a half, five hour run, because I have to walk a dog, which is lovely. Um, the source for that is What is Moo has just tweeted this. And What is Moo is usually for the record, and it's actually Drac and Jamie who are talking about it. And that's on Bilge Pumps, uh, on our tweet, but I have just tweeted out the What is Moo tweet on my Twitter. Uh, our wife Rue to bit the dust last weekend. I'm behind around 20 hours on the Doctor and Drag. <laughs> Only 20? I haven't been working hard enough. Uh, this runs Most of the other Sonic ships are not actually armed with missiles. The cost is too much. Um, depends on the nation you're dealing with. Quite a lot are, lo are fully laden, especially in the. It also depends on the area they're going. I'm fairly sure if the British ones are pottering around the UK, probably less. But I'm also fairly sure the ones currently in the South China Sea and the Indian Ocean and with the task group are fully loaded to bear. Okay, wait, what is that? CH46, what is the number? I said, have a look at it. First one, have you ever been to Portland? Yes, I've been to Portland. Depends which Portland you mean. The one in the UK? Yes. The one in um, Oregon? No. M thirty five Benos. If that is one of the CH forty one of the CH forty six, she's saying it was next. British arrived CH forty seven Bravo November. I think she might already be there. My guy T two nine. Are the British or French working on a hypersonic missile on the US? Uh, she seems to be having a hard time. I think everyone's working on hypersonic missiles. Whether saying they're publicly doing it or not, they're all working on it. Mainly because they all need to work on them to understand how they possibly could counter them. So they're all working on them, because if you don't work on them, you don't understand them enough to know how to count them. That's got, I was imagining that whilst they were being transported and transferred, they'd be a sealed unit. Uh, probably a flotation device, just in case it gets dropped in link. That's becoming something very, very complicated. Something like that. You know what would be funny? If your drac would just randomly show up in each other's lives. <laughs> Don't joke about that. That's actually a real possibility. There are times when we are, you know, very close to each other. Something like that. What is a VLS cell actually? Well, a VLS cell is 
basically imagine a rocket launch system, a rocket launch site. You know, like you see when you see the, the NASA rockets or the Russian rockets launching up to space. Imagine that condensed into a very small box. That's your VLS cell. It's designed to deal with maybe a cold launch. And that's lovely, but also possibly the dam uh, potential damage of a hot of an accidental launch, hot launch. And it's designed to send all the data into the missile. The missile needs to launch. So it's got various connection position uh, connectors in it that interface with the missile and provide data transfer. It's got various systems which are designed to check on the status of the missile. So it actually becomes a very complicated instrument very quickly. Um, Anuk, CH-46 have been retired by USN, USMC three to four years ago. Yes, but they were high, They were bought by the, um, in this case, the picture is, the State Department. So, basically, it's a Department of State Air Wing CH-46 N-38TU. Uh, Bureau number 154038 over Kabul, evacuating the U.S. Embassy today. Uh, second, what appears to be the 154038 on the deck of USS Hancock during the frequent wind evacuation of Saigon. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Dirt Squad, they can program pretty much any variable into the firing solution. However, the going active on loss of the wire is set to give the weapon the best chance of target acquisition. Uh, that's for the sort of torpedoes discussion that's going on. Uh, Bug Guy 8829, do you think the US should have kept the US New Jersey active and activated her sisters for Vietnam? I'd read the North Vietnamese didn't have an answer for her and she was doing a lot of damage. <laughs> It's certainly tempting, but at a certain point, you're just pummeling a lot of high explosive into Vietnam. For what purpose? If you're not going to launch a ground offensive into North Vietnam, why are you pummeling them? Cas uh, Cascadian, any chance of a video on the Juno Cole Doctrine? Yes, there's going to be one at some point. Relic, Dr. Clark, can I just say we need to get you more books? I'm always agreeing to getting more books. There are more books coming. Um, there are more books. Eventually, in here is going to be finished, and the bookshelves down below and above are going to be completely finished. Because I mean, the bookshelf up there is covered with iron brew bottles, which are going to go on this wall as a lit up iron blue display. Eventually, the building stuff in here that's built in here to fix the floor is going to be done. Now I finished the outside, all, all the outside stuff. And then I'll get the bookshelves in down there, which are going to be book troughs. Um, they're literally going to be shelving units which come, which roll out from leaf and have the books stacked in like that, at a sort of da -da 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 this way, uh, you know, flat this way, so I can roll them out and look at the books and pull them out when I need. And um, then the fridge is going in underneath here. And then there's going to be more books in this section. And books up there and books on both levels up there. And there's going to be another book stack up on this wall. Uh, there's going to be a vertical shelf, uh, a shelving system put in going up on the wall there. And there's going to be paint, uh, paintings and eventually there's going to be a railway here. There's lots of plans and there's lots of painting for the wall planned and various other things. But it's, uh, it, it, it's finishing it all off and actually getting the time at home to do it. And also being able to bribe my number one builder to come and help me out. So I basically have to keep buying um, Drac barbecue and cooking for him. It's, my, it's our current rate of thing. I provide the food. He comes and helps.
There again, I just heard that the US, Israel is helping the US for hypersonics. I'm not surprised. They are pretty far advanced in it. This is one thing I'm saying. I'm scared. If a war ever broke up, a lot of people will die. Yes. That's the reality, unfortunately, of war. A lot of people will die. And the more advanced weapons you get, the more people will die. And that's why it's so important we study the history of it. So, because remember, wars happen when politics fails. And you increase the chance of politics failing if you don't understand the consequence of it failing. So that's why it's but important to be prepared so you can show, so people, so the politicians and leaders realize in front of them what the very real stakes are. But it's also important to understand the reality of the history and understand the reality of the conflict. You can't protect from war by ignoring it and not funding it. That doesn't protect you. It tends to lead to a full sense of security. But guys, you're saying, how many missiles to do much uh, to do much reasonable damage and put out a war on or damage on a warship? Uh, how many missiles too much, too reasonable on, put on a warship? Recently put on a warship. Ooh, you can definitely go uh, justify going to a first rate about 140. Quite happily, 100, 100. So you could probably get to 160 quite happily before you start calling an arsenal ship. Um. Alexander Simon, a shed of books, that's the plan. Total aside, did you know the US Air Force bought an Area 51 game and made it free to download? Not at all suspect. <laughs> that doesn't surprise me. Frank Simon, did the Italians have their own special ideas for naval war? Um, like the French did. Uh, they did have lots of ideas. I'd like to do get into a proper video there for that one. Have you read Mimi and Tonto go forth about the naval battle of Lake Tanganyika? Not yet, no. Anik, like a library book return card, to an extent. Um, Relic, hello. Odd question. Any books regarding the German airship bombing campaign versus the UK during World War I that can be recommended, if you are aware of any? I... Okay. Now, interestingly enough... Interestingly enough, I have a book around here which is on the air war in World War One. And that might well answer your questions. He says if he can find it. Not that one, not that one. Not that one. No, no, no. Ooh, not that. That was cool. That's cool. Oh, that's done. That's a done curve book. I was wondering where I put that. And there's my time book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I found that one. Um. <laughs> no, 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 not that one. That was in this box. It's not in this box. That'd be annoying. It's not in this box. I have done a video not that long ago about it. Ah, yes. This one. Um it's got some good stuff in it about that. So, yeah, if I was going to recommend any book to start off with, it would be this one. Because the Royal Naval Air Service Water Ones are charged with defending the air defense, providing the air defense of Britain. So, this is a good starting one. Yep. Oh, right. Hmm. 
Tell me, any suggestions for good nail pictures for my bedroom office? I already got a good East Indian one for my ba bathroom. Um, all I will say is Drac keeps coming up with some very cool paintings. Occasionally he sends me, it gives me one, I just like it, I love them. There are going up here, and I've got a few more I'm getting for here. But I want to see what they look like before I recommend them to other people. This one, here's a political question. Now, you state yourself as a conservative. What's your view on business and people not paying taxes? If they don't pay the taxes, how can a state be able to afford war, war material? Uh, I'm a British conservative. You pay your taxes. And in the nicest way, I'm a British conservative. I also support the National Health Service and will give you the right-wing argument for why you need a National Health Service and why it's sensible. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I'm sorry, but the first rule of a conservative is you're supposed to be a not. Uh, you're supposed to use evidence. Not if you look at the traditional thing, uh, conservatives are supposed to govern and from a position of evidence, not ideology. And ideally, they're supposed to be about conserving things. That's your country your people, nature, the environment, all those things, that is what a conservative is supposed to be about. That's the kind of conservative I am. It makes me very old-fashioned in many, many respects and gets me into trouble with a lot of people on both sides. Because sometimes I will be the person in the room arguing for social housing because I support it. And I get told, but, 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 and I go, no. It makes sense. If you're in a expensive area and you want to have people like doctor, like nurses, like school teachers, etc., who you aren't, and other key state work, key workers living in that area, and you aren't prepared to pay them the wages they would need to live in that area normally, but you need them living there to support the functions of the organization in the area, you need to support it then you need to provide some form of social housing. It's simple. Hmm. Take care of it, Rook of Vasava. That's great. You only have to look through a couple of hundred books. Relax. I was thinking airships. They have both. Osprey Publishing. Also, it's a good book, yes. Relic. Royal Naval Air Service by Philip Jarrett, right? Yes, that's one I was recommending. Frank Smiler. Dr. Z, there's a new Osprey book about UK charism and the mix reference to armor carriers. It's from the Jewel series. <laughs> yeah. It should do. He's amazing. He's very good. He does a lot of great research. Jamie does a lot of good work. Strong. I have a feeling Dewey Decimal Classification System is not used by the good doctor. No, it's on the um, what am I currently working on system. Bad guy eight eight two nine. The new IQ before seventy two. Have read that a large part of their military forces forces in its path makes a good military target, but a lot of innocent people would die, not just there in any war. Mm. I'm not sure what this is a response to. Cajun, show me any modern country which doesn't have large loopholes written into their tax laws that companies don't try and exploit. And honestly... Hmm. Something like that, that's the type of conservatives that a lot of people are but don't know they are. Hmm. Graham Hanna, I'd say, I'd call it being a realist and practical. Yeah. Alexander Simpson, so you don't read the Daily Mail? Nope. I read The Independent, The Guardian, The Times, and The Telegraph. Because somewhere in between all four of those is probably the truth. Sometimes I just ignore them and go straight to where I can find the closest source of information to what's going on. 
That's even better. I'm a great example of why socialized healthcare would be good. I have insurance which provides for medications. I require human sand at a sink to do my dish short eating. Where I find a job, I'd, or where I to find a job, I'd lose that insurance and the type of jobs I could find do not provide insurance. Yeah. For those who are wondering, the right wing argument, the conservative argument for National Health Service is very simple. Happy pe uh, healthy people equal happy people. Happy people equal economically productive people. Economically productive people equals better for the nation equals more happy people. It goes round. It's a virtuous circle. You provide a baseline level of medical health care. Okay, there are some things which I am uh, do not want on the NHS in the nicest way, unless there is a very good psychological reason. I do not see why anyone should be getting... Or actual reason, we should be getting, I don't know, what a Botox injections on the NHS. That just seems weird to me. I'm, if there's a good medical reason, I'm happy to support it. But if someone's going in, I, I just want to look younger. Here, give me Botox. No. No, that was not, not a good thing. Go and pay for it yourself. But in a modern, if you want to deal with problems like making sure you have enough population coming through you want women to feel safe having children so you need that health that health care uh you want kids to grow up healthy and well you need that level of health care you dealing with a national crisis like an epidemic you want the level of health care accident emergency you want health care and there are lots of things because and it takes burden off businesses as well because if you have this level of health care it means the businesses can invest in their staff because either they have to decide they have to spend money on giving them health insurance, which is going to be costly and administrative, or they could lose staff through health issues and then they lose good workers. So it is far better for the economy if you can provide a base level of health care and therefore it's better for the country. It's sensible. And in the end, what comes out now? Do I agree with sometimes how the NHS is run? No. Do I sometimes think that we should have a national insurance system rather than necessarily the system which we have, which is centralized bureaucracy, i.e., an Australia, Canada style system or German style system versus the British system? Depending on the day of the week and the issues I'm dealing with, I can be inclined. But honestly, they do good work, they're getting things done, and my main problems in life with the NHS are nothing to do with the doctors and nurses, but entirely to do with the multiple levels of bureaucracy it has above the doctors and nurses who never seem to understand anything about healthcare. <sighs> so anyway, what would a modern first rate look like, and how would you board a, a modern ship via hacking? Um, it, it, good luck with the hacking, and a modern first rate would probably be somewhere in the region of 20 to 30,000 tons and would be for Stunga missiles. It would look kind of like a Kirov class. Bud Guy uh, hello Stafford again. Um, Bud Guy do you think modern air defenses make non stealth aircraft and missiles useless in a peer on peer fight? It depends what day of the fight we're talking about. A lot. Anyway, I'm out of Iron Brew. And it's almost eight minutes off five hours. So, this runs from a healthy workforce is a productive workforce. Yes. So anyway, a lot of the US social problems can be solved by good health care system. They already pay more than the UK that I think pays by most per capita. Um, honestly, the UK system is not the most expensive of them all. There are, uh, you sometimes get some very interesting sources and people often try and pretend that the only medical system's options are a US style system or a British style system. And there's a whole range in between that's worth looking at and understanding. 
Alfie Rowe, what do you think of the uh, of universal basic income? I don't think we're at the point at which it's necessary yet, but I can foresee a time if you have enough automated factories and enough automated systems where a UBI becomes a very sensible investment rather than having a complicated to administer um, system of benefits. UBI could be may it could be far more simple, but it depends again on the productivity and the income generated from per worker. I know. And look, ah, the same issues dealing with health insurance companies. They're just yeah, they're complicated. John Shane, have a nice night, Doctor. Take care. On the flip, the flip side of the coin is only operating to the minimum amount of hours for full-time employment as to not have to offer health care and benefits to current employers and would rather have more your style NHS with medical care option as well as our prescription that covered by OEP or our national service. I would agree. In a nice way, it's better that it's better for everyone if you can afford the if you can support these things. But let's be honest. My mum had cancer uh, a few years ago back, and at no point did anyone present us with a bill. She got treated in a world-class facility. There is not a single person that would make me think that that, sister, that center where they, she was lucky enough to go, go and be treated was anything less than world-class. In fact, it's one of the best in the world. I know it is. She was taken care of every step of the way and touch wood or goes good. At no point was there a bill. At no point did we have to focus on anything other than looking after her. And that meant that me and my sister were still able to work during it. We were still working and we were able to focus on her, which meant she got better quickly and we were back to being fully productive members of society far more quickly. And she herself was back to being a productive member of society pre-COVID as well. Um, the thing is, that was thanks to that. Instead of it being a drain on the system or various other issues, it was sorted. That's the advantage. Um, <laughs> uh, Frank's one. Dr. C, Drac, and Jamie have been contracted to build a dog house. How much is spent and how many cans can it fit? Depends. How many dogs and what size? Alexander, do you know the US Navy already had a naval base in Lothfoyle before they joined World War II? June 94. Um, 362 civilian, uh, civilian technicians arrived in London, though. All these things work. Death Squad, the UK NHS is the most efficient health service with some of the best cost benefit outcomes in the world. The issue is that its funding is 8.5% GDP in the UK versus 11.5% and 9% GDP in Germany. Yeah, but. This is going to sound strange. Uh, the way it's worked out in Germany and what's included in Germany spending is, again, British spending doesn't include uh, includes social services is split off from NHS, whereas it's included in Germany in uh, health spending, from what I understand. So that makes a sort of difference, and you can spin it round. Um, so it's not quite a like for like comparison, but there are pros and cons. I said, take care, Sean Brennan. Thank you, and for thirty-five. Thank you. Um, don't worry. Take care. Uh, a UK system not work for US, but a Japanese or German system would work. Yeah, that's probably more likely. Take care, Seneca Nero. Thank you, Matthias Slavic. Thank you, Tattoo Two. Alzaski. Thank you, uh, Bud Guy Eighty Two Nine. How large do you think USN and RN should be? I would like to see the RN be a bit bigger. The USN and I could have a lot of questions, but at least sixty six constellations needed. Take care, my sixty four forty. Something there, parking bills for visitation. They were waived as well at the place we were at, thankfully. Um, otherwise, they can be very, very expensive, but that particular sender waives them. That's good. Night, night. Cajun. I had two ups of kidney stones a couple of years ago. All I had to pay was parking and prescription fees for painkillers. Mmm. Thank glad to hear that, Savage Thompson. Michelle Hines, thank you. Always a pleasure to answer questions. Melanie, you, happy. I've also had cases of cancer delay due to diagnosis due to restriction imaging required, which doesn't sound good. 
No, uh, they all there are always these scare stories which go around, but honestly, when you start digging into them, it's no, and you can be sent elsewhere in this country. They do operate as a national system in the UK. They will send you around if they if they if the local hospital nearest hospital doesn't have. That specializes doesn't have the uh, have has a long waiting time. They will hunt for one, which is viable for you to get to. Thank you, Tis Ronsfort and Admiral Beatty. Thank you, thank you, Steph Thompson, DG Forty. Thank you. Take care, Lonnie. Take care, Senator Nero. Take care, Frank Spano. Melanie, I'm more and more thinking you should move to the UK and apply for citizenship. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Just about healthcare. I, I, I know I'm not supposed to advise people to do that for <laughs> reasons of, you know, healthcare moving, but yeah, seriously, <laughs> it sounds like sensible. Dirt Squad figures come from an academic payment. I hope they'd have accounted for that. Uh, Dirt Squad, I would love to say they would, but honestly, I deal with some of the academics, and sometimes if it If I have a healthy scepticism whenever I see statistics, um, because there are lies, damn lies of statistics, and I often go and then bury myself in the footnotes and the various requirements and where they source those statistics from, and it can get interesting. Take care, Nook. Take care, Carl Gazbo. Take care, Graham Highlander. And this one, I feel my question added 20 minutes of the stream. Yeah, don't worry. Take care, Grace RC. Take care, everyone. And thank you, Paul Johnson. Thank you, everyone. And um, take care. That's it. Bam, bam. Bam. And I will say, as always, if you like the videos, please like, please share if you want to. And if you fancy subscribing, there's a subscribe button down there. There's also a little bell if you want to see when another live goes up. And um, Discord links and uh, Patreon all down below. Thank you. Take care.